it. Here we go. Everything is okay. <laughs> we're live we're live bigots and nerds and slow boys and slow girls and bigots we are live what's up everybody i got jay dyer here sorry we're 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 later than we're later than the innkeeper's daughter cycle for this one folks but we're we're talking about we're talking about wicker man wicker man the resurgence of paganism Neo-paganism, I'm here with neo-pagan expert Jay Dyer. Jay Dyer is is the leader of his own neo-pagan cult. It, 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 revol- <laughs> it, it, it revolves around puka shell worship. You see his necklace, he's wearing the sacred puka shells. Those are harvested actually from a, from a, from a sacred moor in the Isles, in the Isle of Wight. Those are from a a shaman named uh, named named uh, 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 Tita Tita Steve. Um, so yeah, guys, we're we're talking Wicker Man today. We, I just Jay just forced me to watch one of the what I I didn't realize would be one of the funniest shitty horror movies ever made. Is Nick Cage's Wicker Man. Uh, and we're also discussing the classic 1976 Wicker Man, which is a, a really surprisingly good film. I'd put off watching it. Jay and I had talked about this on a stream long ago when we were talking about um, Burning Man and some of these uh, neo-pagan cults. This must have been back in like 2017, which is crazy. Yeah, two seven, 2017, 2018, this seems like ages ago. So we're we're cycling back to a lot of these same topics, and it seems just as fresh because it is half a freaking decade ago that we talked about these things. Even understand that like is that am i talking to above you or like is your ego like have you humbled your ego or you like are you f- like so s- chopped in like ego matrix that you can't even understand what i'm saying I, bl- I totally blew it i didn't read the chat and jay was muted and the chat's pissed i had jay muted for the last like three minutes but he was not muted there you guys got that i'm sorry guys boomer tech issues <clears throat> it's okay it's just it's just so I know the flyouts that are gonna be run on me when I come on this channel. <laughs> it's like I'm always I've always gotta do a little bit of gaslighting and psyops. I know when, the, psyops here. Here. It's, it's the goal if you guys if you guys haven't been here before, if you guys are new to the channel, you know that the goal here is to gaslight Jay as much as possible, to underhandedly slight him, to make him feel less important. This is also why on the screen on Jay's portion of the screen, it actually says Tristan. I, <laughs> on Google Meets, I can't freaking figure out how to drag my name off. If I drag it off the side here, it just pops back up. So for the record, that is, that is Mr. <clears throat> Jay Dyer. That is not Tristan, unfortunately. I mean, that's kind of the ultimate insult is to call me Tristan. But The, the insult, ultimate insult to myself. I'm, I'm, I'm so used to the abuse uh, and the toxicity on this channel that, you know. I mean, you admitted to me uh, before the stream started that your dogs basically started crying because of your toxicity. So, yeah, um, you just got exposed. I, I was I was pretty much just exposed. Well, they're crying. They're crying boogers. Is that was the that was the even the key? More bizarre. It didn't, it didn't <laughs> even make sense, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's gonna be my uh, my my country music debut. My dog, actually, my dog. though, for real, it is full circle, right? I mean, when you and I started talking about social issues philosophy religion all this kind of crazy you know diet yoga culture that's out there we started talking about a lot of these cults and the rise of paganism and and i think burning man is a perfect example of that and burning man harkens to to wicker man for sure and the old one is a classic a lot of people have forgotten this movie and it's weird because everybody's always like, have you seen the old Wicker Man, the original? I'm like, yeah, like 20 years ago, bro. 
Are you done talking? Because I can unmute you so that they can hear. Okay. Okay. So you guys, I, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, this this movie was it was really good, man. I'm I'm surprised at how how non not it's it's very non stereotypically Hollywood. Um, it's very non non stereotypical Hollywood, isn't it? It doesn't it doesn't lionize neo paganism. It doesn't exalt it, and it doesn't denigrate the Christian character in the film. Um, you and I did Midsummer, like what was it four years ago or something when it came out? Maybe it was 2019. Yeah. And that movie was uh, was essentially a remake of this, right? It's, it, yeah. Midsummer is stylistically uh, a, a better remake than this of the actual remake of Wicker Man, but it's as far as the substance of the film, the meaning of the film, it's like it's weaponized pop culture. Midsummer is all about uh, the, the character whose name is Christian in Midsummer <clears throat> is ends up being sacrificed in the May Day ritual and yeah. led along this kind of breadcrumb trail into this horrific sacrifice scene that's very it's very frightening right midsummer in a lot of ways is more scary than the than wicker man wicker man has a sense of humor it's got you know it, it's creepy but it's not like a a movie that's going to give you nightmares or anything like that whereas midsummer it was a, a really subversive film about the the denigration of Christianity, the destruction of manhood, and the sacrifice of the uh, naive, naively virtuous Christian male character at the altar of paganism to bring back this kind of new, almost like a new aeon of uh, going back to the ancestors and the old gods. Whereas Wicker Man, it's all, it almost seems like a blatant critique on paganism. What do you think, Jay? I mean, it, to me, it doesn't seem like the, the neo-pagan movement looks really good at the end of, of Wicker Man, and the Christian character is very virtuous and actually has you know a legit martyr's I mean, let, death. Let's just cut to the chase. The real reason you don't like Midsommar is because it hits too close to home. It's okay. We we understand people's grandparents sometimes do uh, you know step into the honeymoon situation and push the butt of the person who's engaging in the coitus. I understand. That's I forgot that. I don't even remember that scene. Yeah. That's is is that that's what you're insinuating? Yeah. It's, it's so so we're it's the grandparents in, the, in that traditional pagan setting step into the uh, marital coitus room and they push the butt to help. So coitus uh, is that is that like a bougie way to say it? I thought it's I thought it was coitus. Is it coitus? I wouldn't know. I don't talk about these disgusting I, things all the time I, like I you. I have fun with words. I just sort of take them in Co new directions. And oh, because you're like an artist. You basically, it's like yeah, it's kind of you wouldn't understand, but it's sort of it's more of like a, you know, it's like a biohacking thing that we do. <coughs> my uh, my commune. So in my commune, mm. we get creative with our pronunciations. So yeah, the just... the, Eng the English language is his is his canvas. It is his canvas, but um. Anyway, so yeah, I think you're right to say that Midsummer is kind of a critiquing of Christian morals, and and I'm not sure what the point of Midsummer was. It almost started. seems like the point of it is just to destroy your psyche. It almost seems like it's just an onslaught of the. Psyche. Yeah, well, and that's the guy that made Hereditary, and that was like a straight up, you know, ritual magic uh, horror movie that I've done a few videos on, but. Yeah, I did another video back at the time, not with you, but on my own channel, just comparing Midsommar to Wicker Man. Um, and so, yeah, Wicker Man is also, the reason it's not Hollywood is a British film. So uh, it, it, a lot of British films tend to have a little more slower plot development. They're more focused on ideas, not so much the, you know, boobs and explosions, you know, like Hollywood typically is. So there's a lot of uh, boobs in Wicker Man, though. There's that's what the one critique is. There's there's a little bit of there's some boobage, some some yeah, unnecessary, um, <clears throat> some sexy and, and, scenes. But, but at least in the you know ORGY scene, you know they kind of like had people clothed and no, yeah, it wasn't like super it. graphic. It's not hyper. It's not really really graphic. But it's you know the sexuality is uh, is an underlying weaponized aspect of the neo pagan culture within. Yeah, within that's the, film. the thing is that you know when he gets to the island it's 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 a return to full-on you know uh sexual degeneracy basically so yeah <clears throat> the other thing i would say is that um you know in, in wicker man the first wicker man we don't really have it still kind of has a loose christian theme it doesn't have the notion of us coming away thinking that lord summer isle and the the, the people on this island are the way we should go <laughs> i mean i think we come yeah. away with thinking that it's a horrific 
worldview and situation. And it's not something we want to go back to. And yet here we are in the modern world, literally going back to, you know, this worldview with the rise of paganism. And you could include the new age stuff because it overlaps, right? Like the Absolutely. pagan stuff and the new age stuff overlap at Burning Man, which has this giant burning effigy of a man, which is a traditional Celtic Druidic practice related to human sacrifice. So, yeah, I think that <clears throat> you know, the first one at least has this sort of loose Christian-ish theme where the guy sees himself as a martyr. They call him a martyr. He's actually dying because he was faithful to his confession. And, and mm. we don't get any ideas that, you know, oh, this is so much of a superior uh, situation. Then. Right. It's almost the opposite, right? He he is an actual virtuous character who goes to this. Yeah. Uh, he, he comes to the island of Summer Isle and his... Uh, He's, he's trying to find a missing girl. So for those of you who haven't seen the movie, who aren't going to watch the movie, we'll kind of give you a quick summary. He's looking for a missing girl. Uh, a lot of the inhabitants of the Scottish island, who their accents are great, right? It seems like they actually cast kind of local actors here. Uh, the costumes are, are really good in the original. Um, you know, even, even the clothes look worn. You know, it's one of the, one of the most annoying things with, with, with Hollywood films is you'll have everybody's clothing looks completely spotless and brand new. Uh, you know, like Nick Cage in the, in the remake, he's a cop and he's got his leather jacket and it's just all shiny and new is, you know, there's nothing, nothing has ever been worn that the characters are wearing, but even like, you know, the, the, the costumes, the set design, um, and, and the actors that were chosen, they've got a lot, a lot of people with gnarled faces and they're like mm -hmm. old kind of not really overtly creepy looking people. They just kind of look like, you know, down home old Scottish folk and, they receive him with a lot of uh, suspicion. You know, they're, they're very suspicious of outsiders. They're not so sure about this guy. And they're really evasive. You know, he's asking them, well, <clears throat> you know, where, where is Rowan? This girl, I'm coming on. I, I, I need to, uh, I'm coming here and there, there's a missing girl on the island. Which the one critique of the, of the plot would be that, well, who, who snitched on the missing girl? But you actually, we realize later on. Yeah, we realize that, later why he was he would be sent there because it doesn't make sense as you're watching it we're like why would somebody this island seems so tightly knit and it's such a an insulated community that are that are completely wrapped up in these old pagan practices and the old ways and worshiping the old gods well who snitched you know who's snitching on the missing girl well you find out later on at the end of the film after his journey of discovery through this uh this labyrinth of of neo-paganism and of kind of a return to the so-called old ways which it seems very authentic um we'll I'll get into that i'll ask you i know you you've done a lot of research on this type of type of stuff and uh you, you've got a lot of insight into especially like the the origins of uh, Western occultism in Victorian magic and the Victorian age because this is alluded to in the film as well but um Anyways, the, he goes through this labyrinth of learning about their neo-pagan practices, which are depraved and a little bit degenerate, very, very much based on fertility rituals, uh, phallus, seeming phallus worship, uh, and, and like the May Day, the May Day dancing, dancing around the Maypole, um, and, and, and all of these practices that they are engaged in. And their crops have failed, and their sacrifices have failed, so they need a human sacrifice. He believes the human sacrifice is going to be a little girl, but we end up finding that there's a different plan a little later on. We'll talk about the ending maybe a little bit later. But um, one of the aspects that I thought was really interesting of this movie is the protagonist, the main character, it's so rare to have a legitimately Christian character in any film that comes out of Hollywood. You mentioned this is a, it's a British film. Uh, Christopher Lee is in it. It's probably one of his better roles. I think he really, he really liked this film a lot. I think he was real proud of it. Um, and the Christian character, I mean, it starts out with them praying. I think they're praying something from a psalm, and I think he's some sort of a reader or something in the Anglican Church. He's yeah. reading from one of the epistles of St. Paul, and it actually shows him taking communion, and he's established to be a virtuous virgin character. He's a, he's a virgin male who's engaged to be married and is very serious about his faith, which is consistently tested through the film of them trying to incite him into lust and uh, get him to join their kind of reproductive rituals, which it seems like their whole island is all about. But uh, can, you, can you think of any other movies where does it have, like a real virtuous Christian character that's not made out to be a fool or a buffoon? 
Yeah, I think you'd have to go back to pre sixties countercultural revolution Hollywood to find that kind of stuff. Cause you know, prior to that time, Hollywood, even into the sixties, was still making Christian themed films. And so there were there were a lot of blockbusters and kind of big, you know, Bible type movies even into the 1960s. And then after the, the 60s countercultural revolution, you get, particularly after Rosemary's Baby, this pretty much paradigm shift, I would say, in the <clears throat> themes and attitudes that Hollywood projects. And so even though this isn't Hollywood, the 70s, right right on the, after the, the 60s uh, cultural revolution, you start to get the rise of things like Led Zeppelin, you get the rise of the <clears throat> Led Zeppelin actually popularized the Lord of the Rings again. It became yeah. it kind of turned into a new phenomenon. So people were getting into the old ways, the old ideas. I'm not saying that Lord of the Rings is necessarily pagan, but there was this idea that um, we could return to the land and we don't have to be, you know, necessarily weird new agers. We can be the straight up pagans and so there's this <clears throat> revival of paganism after the 1960s not every people are maybe uh dis discouraged by the hippie movement and so they start looking for other uh avenues a lot of boomers and this is where i think we get the rise of, of new pa of the, the neo-pagan stuff the rise of paganism uh the, the pentagon was putting out stuff at this time talking about the archaic revival talking about you know similar to SRI documents that you covered the other day, changing image of the man. They were also studying um, primitivism, or, or it's called the archaic revival, yeah. and the idea of returning to <clears throat> the land. And and, and and just throwing this out there, we've talked about Terrence McKenna. Terrence McKenna, you know, really connected the Esalen Institute, yeah. which was getting uh, you know tons of institutional funding, government funding. And McKenna really uh, helped to to yep. bring about the popularity of this archaic revival yep. thing, and then he connected exactly. this to the rave scene in the '90s, which was kind of the, you know, the the afterbirth of the Cultural Revolution of the '60s. Yep. Yeah, this is one of those kind of like offshoots, right, of yep. the 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 rise of the New Age and the '60s counterculture. You get this offshoot of people going into the domain of being interested in outright paganism and ritual magic, right? And so, uh, uh, I'm not saying Lord of the Rings is is that, but it's grouped with that via led zeppelin. that's a that's an interesting point i'm really glad you brought that because i actually wrote down i wrote down led zeppelin 3 just in my notes while watching wicker man yeah. because the music in wicker man the music's really well done it's kind of a folky rock acoustic guitar style music right. and it's you can tell it's really influenced by that record and that record which was you know i mean it's a really good rock record for i think it's led zeppelin's best album i'm not a huge led zeppelin fan anymore but they did have that that record was really solid with all you know it had um was it the tangerine and over the hills yeah, and far I like away yeah i used to have all the i was a big Led zeppelin fan back in my my teens and 20s and i think everybody has those phases where you get really into classic rock you know when of course. you're younger or whatever of um, course so but yeah the you know this this film seems to really tie in with that aesthetic of yeah. you know acoustic folky music yeah. and i and although this is a critique of this countercultural movement that was happening at about the same time because i think I think that record was like 1973 or four, mm -hmm. and this movie was 76. So, you know, this is kind of right after the, you know, the failed, it was, it was the seemingly failed cultural revolution that seemed to crescendo and peak with Altamont and Woodstock. Uh, Altamont and Woodstock kind of being these huge, you know, throwback pagan festivals, essentially. Right? Exactly. I mean, at Woodstock, they had that, um, oh, what was the guru's name? The, um, they had that. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Yes, yes. They had Ravi Shankar was there. So there was this idea of, you know, infusing the culture with the 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 Eastern practices, yoga, Hinduism. And then at the same time, you've got other characters like, well, Hendrix was kind of this godlike character to so many people at the time. And when you look at what Woodstock ended up being, I mean, it was a, it was a giant human social experiment. And it was... Um, this is a really disgusting thing. I mean, like just almost half a million people. How many people were at Woodstock? Was it over half yeah, a million? It huge. Everybody's just caked in mud, stinking like underarms and butt. Yeah, I mean, right? it, just, it doesn't just look like a lot of fun. But, rolling in mud like um, pigs, acting yeah, like animals. Yeah, we're going to fight men, man. Like, <clears throat> you know, there's a legitimate concern with the... Vietnam War and all that stuff. Right? Yeah, like the 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 lies that were being perpetuated for the military industrial complex. But then what happened was 
as many people theorize, the way to neutralize that real opposition was to steer it over into hedonism. Yes. And that's exactly what happened through a lot of yeah. these movements. And the the Jim Morrison of- being like the most, I think he's the most emblematic character of this exactly. whole thing where, you know, I don't know what his real intentions were. Uh, he seemed like a really tortured, lost kind of, you know, lost soul type character. Whether he was, you know, a blatant tool and knew what he was doing. His father was Stephen Morrison, Admiral Stephen Morrison, who was involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident. It is debatable on what level of knowledge Stephen, Admiral Stephen Morrison had. So, but regardless of, you know, his knowledge of being involved in these, you know, PSYOP type things, Jim Morrison was, uh, he was an instrumental character in a kind of bringing back the, the, this, the, the idea of Bacchanalia and, um, (laughs) he was obsessed with Pan. He was, he was really into, um, uh, what's the, the other God of, um, of wine, uh, Dionysus. Dionysius, exactly. He almost saw himself as like the, the incarnation of Dionysius, and he had visions of right. you know satyrs and these old gods prancing around. And um, I think uh, I think Oliver Stone's. I think that's Oliver Stone's. That's my favorite Oliver Stone film. It's actually the Doors movie. I think that's one of his better ones. That and JFK. But yeah, M- Morrison was was real instrumental in bringing this stuff about as well. He called himself the Lizard King. He you know chanted these kind of mantras and. And really infuse that psychedelic, um, <clears throat> hypersexualized and really strangely dreamlike Jungian visual lyrical style with this call back to paganism and then the rock star worship thing too. So all this stuff, I mean, this film is right after all these characters had already peaked and a lot of them died, you know, at their own hands or, Mm. you know, because of drug overdoses or, you know, their hedonism led them to their death. So that's, you know, these characters in the countercultural movement are almost like wicker men. They're almost like willing wicker men that, um, really represented the American male, the, the white, the formerly white Christian male, uh, who, you know, becomes given over to the, the, the excesses of the revolution and just basically offs himself ritualistically. Publicly. Yeah. I think the commonality here and, and, and then I'll move into some of the first scenes that you mentioned there is that when we turn away from God, you know, the first thing that we begin to worship is nature and, mm-hmm. you know, nature, the generative principle, which is kind of the most, uh, I guess, evident thing that we notice in nature there's death and there's rebirth you know there's the seed there's the the womb and then we have rebirth this is typically the cycle of nature this is the ouroboros that we see pictured in a lot of ancient mysteries it actually comes up in the nicholas cage uh one if you if you were looking so when um uh what's the main character the the, the, the police Ro- officer guy? rowan and the one well, in, in the old one it's that's um you know the guy's name yeah yeah his name anyway, is sergeant neil <laughs> howie neil howie Okay, the, the, the officer, when he shows up, uh, you know, we see him taking the Eucharist, which is a form of sacrifice. And we are being kind of given a foreshadowing of the fact that he's going to be the sacrifice. And what, what's interesting is that he is sort of completely oblivious to all of the symbols and imagery that confront him that he should have noticed. Uh, so I don't think he's a malicious character, but he's kind of a fool character. He's a bit he's naive. A yeah, he's the fool king, and yeah, and he becomes the sacrifice. Well, they literally dress him up as a fool. Well, they exactly. ritualistically set him up to willingly become the fool, play the yeah. part of the fool in that sacrifice. Yeah, and so when he gets to the island, you know, he should have noticed. Well, why do the boats have the you know superstitious eye painted on the front of the boat? Yeah. When he gets to the inn, it's the green man inn, and you know, the green man is a you know traditional pagan image. Uh, of nature or pan or something like that. So the worship of the green man is a, is an ancient English druidic thing. And so he's not really paying attention to all these uh, signs. And he also doesn't realize or notice that he does a little bit later on, but there's nothing Christian on the Island at all. In fact, the church is in ruins. Yeah. So there's no church. And uh, you know, in the so-called Christendom of England and the UK, he should have noticed that, you know, why do we not have, uh, a functioning church and, and minister here of any kind. And uh, he begins to suspect, well, it looks like they do have some kind of religion, but they've left Christianity at some point in the distant past, presumably a long time ago, because the church is, looks like it's been in ruins for a century or two. Uh, and they return to the, uh, you know, traditions of, <laughs> of their fathers, uh, the, the pagan traditions, 
but I think in, he can't, he still can't fathom the possibility that they would have returned to something like human sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the obliviousness of the character. And I mean, it ends up leading to his downfall. He's not, you know, it, his virtue, I guess that it, that would be maybe a somewhat subversive element. I'm not sure how intentional that is, but his virtues do lead to him, uh, his demise. But, from the Christian perspective, of course, his demise is is a true martyrdom, right? It is it's portrayed as a as a, an actual martyrdom, which is not something I've ever really seen in a in a film that came out of you know the Hollywood system. Again, this is a British film, um, so it does make sense that they were allowed a little bit more leeway. I did see. Well, go ahead. The uh, other thing too is I think that there might even be an element to where they want him to be innocent. They don't want him to. Of course. No. So, so they kind of throw this stuff in his face to psyop him, to gaslight him, to um, to mess with him. But they also don't want him figuring it out because they want to sacrifice. And so there seems to be this kind of pagan revelation of the method notion idea going on where uh, the more that he buys into it, the more they would reason he's a willing sacrifice. And so he's complicit essentially in this. And, you know, when you get to the final confrontation between him and Christopher Lee, when they're going to burn him, that's kind of the, the point of that dialogue. I mean, I don't want to get too far ahead, but he's a, he's, he's, he's in a way he's innocent. He's the fool King. Um, he doesn't do anything necessarily wrong or malicious, but his naivety becomes the basis for which he is a, in the mind of the pagans, a complicit and perfectly innocent sacrifice because you want to sacrifice you know, like Christ as the Passover lamb, he's the innocent Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't know evil. Uh, and they actually use that argumentation against him at the end when they're like, why wouldn't you want to be martyred and uh, seated with your God? Right. We don't have that God, but we're giving you the very thing in your worldview you think is like the highest honor to be a martyr. So, um, so yeah, so the, the, the first thing we notice is says, there's nothing Christian going on here at all. He immediately sees uh signs of just already paganism and generative principle worship yeah worshiping the phallus the uh, orgy as he stumbles out of the pub mm -hmm. uh, and he noticed that you know they have no uh compassion for him and so there's no hospitality there's no recognition of his authority he represents man's law or a foreign christendom law the queen's law the king's law uh you know Christian, I'm, I'm saying that yeah. Queen is Christian, but you know what I mean, like right, right, right. Christian. Well, it's the old ways, right? I mean, from the British perspective, the king, the queen, and the the monarchy at that time still had a certain level of respect, which was more than it is now. Uh, the church had more influence than it does now. I mean, it was still, you know, generationally degraded. I mean, you know, yeah. the Church of England, oh, it, it started out on, on terrible footing. So, um, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right there. Yeah, it hadn't degraded to the point that it has now, but. Um, in the film, it represents that. And so he's, we, we start noticing that a lot of the elements within the presentations of the village to him represent him. Yeah. Right. He's going to be represented by the rabbit. He's going to be represented as oh, the hare. It, it, excuse me. It's, it's not a rabbit. It's not a silly rabbit. It's a hare. They specifically say this. It's not a rabbit. It's the hare. Are you of Scottish descent? I am. I don't know if you are. I am. Yeah, actually, yeah. I, okay, well, I'm of like Scottish. I got Scottish and Irish and Dutch. A little Dutch in there. A lot of Dutch, actually. Right. Is that the gay part? Excuse me. I don't. You know, I shouldn't repeat my. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thirty percent Dutch, which is thirty percent gay. No, I'm just joking. Um, we know. Yeah. So. Um. The first thing that occurs is the temptation. And I think that the purpose of that is to, again, make sure it's almost like the pagans think that if they can corrupt him, he won't be a sacrifice. So the more that he keeps his virtue, the, the more fattened he becomes. As mm, a yeah, it's like it charges them up. They, they seem to become more and more excited about him almost as if they've been through this type of situation before which clearly you know this is supposed to be in the past they have yeah mm -hmm. yeah and so again and also they've left science obviously like because they believe that the source of the island's curse is the gods it's yes. nature 
Yes. So well, what's so interesting the- too is I'd love to maybe do a segment on this because uh, you've done a lot of research you, uh, on Victorian age magic, right? John D and these type of characters when. Christopher, Wa- uh, not Christopher Walken, Christopher Lee, his character. Oh, uh, wow, an island. Can you imagine? Don't, please wow. don't sacrifice me. me. I don't want this. This isn't very uncomfortable for me. He almost, be- I almost just made him into Woody Allen. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's hard to separate those. I did the same thing. <laughs> Woody Allen, Christopher Walken, they blend in. Who is Wadi? When you watch the Dune too, it's like the only thing that I think is goofy is putting him as the emperor in this. Like, wait, they put Christopher Walken in there? Are you kidding me? He's the emperor, dude. That's the word. You just spoiled. That's you spoiled the dumbest it. part. I'm not gonna I be able to see it for a couple weeks. Just, he doesn't. He's not even into that much. He's just like that's a couple best. lines, and he's like, "Who's what deep? <laughs> <laughs> the spice must flow. Make the spice <laughs> flow. Spice, um, wow." <laughs> um, spice melange <laughs> yeah um yeah he doesn't make sense as emperor but uh but i mean christopher lee is like perfect as oh he's so good I mean, I don't perfect why he has a karen haircut like they gave him a, an aunt a karen only karen thing that's wrong yeah they should have given him either long hair yeah exactly they should have just given him full long hair he's got like the he's got the the this anglo jufro type thing going it on it looks like somebody's aunt dude this looks like a it's, yeah. But anyway, I don't um, know. I mean, this is contextual. You know, it's 1976. <laughs> At the time, that haircut meant something different. But it was, yeah. He, his character, he 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 talks about. Let's see if I could find my notes on this one. He talks about um one of the first exposures we have to him is he's talking about the like, you know, return to the old gods. He says something about um yeah. about wanting to be like the animals. What does he say? I think I could turn and live with animals. He gives this kind of whole neo-pagan return speech. He says, they do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Yeah. Um, so this this idea of kind of... I mean, there's a lot... Th- those lines is very well written. I think it's one of the better written horror-type films out there. But that, that line in itself, in his little speech about, I think it would have... Um, I, th- I think I could be an animal. They don't make me sick discussing their duty to God. He's got a few more lines. I forget what else he says. But... I mean, it brings up the ideas of kind of anarchism, the the hatred of hierarchy, the 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 spite that he has for the church, the spite that he has for Christ. Um, and yeah, exactly. This is said while it's kind of cut in between. His little speech here is cut in between Sergeant <coughs> Neil kneeling and praying. So Sergeant Neil, whose name kind of you know is an Kneels. Yeah, he's kneels. <laughs> so he's kneeling and praying. He's shown kneeling and praying several times throughout the film. Um, and that's juxtaposed with Christopher Walken, uh, Christopher Lee's uh, speech of, you know, return to the old ways. Yeah, the, um, the next thing that I think stands out is when he starts interviewing people across the island and he, he notices them not celebrating any Christian festivals, but rather the Maypole. And if you notice when the children are dancing around the maple and singing it, they <clears throat> they start um, shaking the banners or, or, or whatever you call the ribbons. And it actually, if you notice, it looks like sperm um, impregnated. Like it, it, there's the pole, of course, is a phallic thing. And then you have yeah. these very spermy, I'm, literally, I'm being serious. Like it looks like uh, sperm. No, you're right. I mean, normally you, you, will, you would project sort of these type of things, of course. But this in this case, you're correct. Well, and they're singing the song about the once was a man and let man on a woman and a woman on a seed and a seed on a tree. Yes. And a <laughs> they're singing a song about the seed, the, the sperm and the generative principle and how the maypole is just really a symbol of uh, nature worship. And, and nature worship is uh, the essence of it is uh, the gender sexual, uh, you know, coitus, as I referred to it earlier. Co- co- coitus, um, coitus. Co-itis. And so that's why he's tempted first with that, right? Willow mm-hmm. sings this song and like bops a tambourine naked in a room and <laughs> he hears her singing. I, I don't know why this particularly turns him on so much, right? Like he doesn't know. I mean, I guess he just feels like she's beckoning me. Like, like she's thirsty. I don't know why he thinks she's thirsty for him. I mean, she is, but you know, she's dancing around singing this goofy song. That's a test for him. 
he passes his test. And so they're like, oh, yeah, this dude's going to be a ripe sacrifice. Um, then he goes and, and well, that then then, hap- then the Maypole scene. Then he goes to the, the, the school. And the children are all <laughs> learning which stuff. They're, re- they're learning root working. Right. Like, yeah. Uh, well, the, and the teacher asks them, like, yeah. what is what is she asked them what the maypole represents? And they say yeah. it's a phallic symbol. <laughs> and yeah. this is when the, the character walks in and he, he's hearing the teacher t- teaching them about phallic symbols. And the maypole is a phallic symbol. And we dance around the maypole. And he's like, and he's what, like is what? This degeneracy? what is yeah. this degeneracy? Yeah, he says that he's, a, he's a total white right wing extremist, you know, white man and, and drops his toxic, toxic white dream, ext- white I can speak right wing extremism on them. He calls them degenerates. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> then he walks out and uh, interviews some more people and he finds the ruins of the church and they say, and in a grave. And he says, you know, where's the, where's the Christian graveyard and the, the chapel. And they're like, Oh yeah, we don't believe in that anymore. Um, we believe in reincarnation. So, right, so we're back to again, classic pagan cycle of nature. Reincarnation is part of that cyclical pagan view. Um, there's no crosses and he makes a cross in the cemetery. Right. Mm. And, uh, he, then he goes to, uh, what's he like? He said, he's at the medicine woman's, uh, room or, or the doctor's uh, room. And he notices like a jar of foreskins, <laughs> a jar of snake oil and a bunch of pickle punks. And then he sees the maidens doing like a naked fire dance or something, jumping over the fire. And so yeah. again, it's like every single possible sign of, dude, there's a bunch of pagans, right? You haven't figured this out yet. Right. And he just, again, totally oblivious to it. Um, and let's see what we got a super chat request from your wife t- saying that she needs you to sing that mating song, dude. One ninety nine. Jamie it goes. It's like Willow I got song. It. Is like, <laughs> I don't remember the, word. I have, the, I have a transcript. Let's see. It's, did Jamie really super chat you saying that she did? She's a one ninety nine. She needs you to sing that mating song, bro. One hundred and ninety nine dollars to your dollar. One hundred and ninety nine dollars of your hard earned. No, it's actually oh, one dollar ninety nine cents. You can't give Tristan one hundred and. She said, "No, don't worry." She she super chatted the bare minimum. This is yeah, Tr- as, as a big as like a dollar ninety nine type of. It was really for you, obviously. I mean, this is your guy's own personal thing here. I'm not trying to like. This is actually. Sure it's getting a little that. weird, to be honest. Just it's a little sure weird. You give me my my ninety nine cents. Is this is it? Let's see. In the woods, there grew a tree, and a fine, fine tree was he. And on that tree, there was a limb, and on that limb, there was a branch. On the branch, there was a nest. That's a different one. That's the sperm song. Isn't it? On that woman, and on that man, there was a woman, and on that woman, there was a tree. (laughs) On that tree, there was a boy, and on that boy, yeah, on that man, there was a seed, and from that seed, there was a boy, and from that boy, there was a man, and from that man, there was a grave, and from that grave, there grew a tree, and on that bed. There was a girl, and on that girl there was a man, and from that man there was a seed, and from that seed there was a boy. They've got the little kids singing this, right? Cycle and from that nature, boy there was a man, and from that man there was a girl. Cycle of nature, man. Yeah. Cycle of life, dude. So anyways, oh. I, obviously, like, that's something that you and Jamie need to work out between yourselves, your obsession Parthenogenesis, reproduction without sexual union. And uh, so this is a bizarre sort of superstitious practice that they're engaging in. This is the, the leaping over the fire thing. And so it's like they're having a their version of the virgin birth. And I think, doesn't Christopher Lee say something about like, I don't believe in the virgin birth. It's just a superstitious. <laughs> and they're doing their version of it. Uh, and he basically is arguing that, you know, the Christian God is dead on this island. Like, we're done with that. We don't. Yeah. That's gone. Um, and his grandfather, Christopher Lee's grandfather in 1868, he says, had founded this island as a way to get away from uh, what they saw as, you know, corrupt, decadent, uh, Christ- Christian, Christendom and Christian civilization. Well, I, wanna, I, I feel like you could give a lot of insight into this character, right? I mean, he's, not, he's never shown. You see some, what, some old paintings of him. But yeah, Lord Summer Isle, he says his grandfra- grandfather brought the, bought the island in 1868. Um, he, he makes his claim, the old gods are not dead. Mm. Um, and then the other character says, well, what of the true god? And he says he's dead. He had his chance. And he blew it. Yeah. So then he goes on to kind of explain Lord Summer Isle's grandfather. Um, he was a distinguished Victorian scientist, an agronomist, and a free thinker, right? So he's kind of this Enlightenment character, yeah. uh, Victorian scientist. But at the same time, he's a free thinker, 
right? So he's obsessed with this, you know, return to occultism, which is interesting. And you've, you've talked about this a lot about John D, okay, the yeah, roots of modern point. scientism being alchemy. So can you maybe uh, expand a little bit and give, give a little bit of background, a quick snippet about the, uh, the Victorian so-called scientists? Well, and... there was this weird uh, bubbling undercurrent during the Victorian time, when, which was uh, there was a lot of Calvinism and a lot of Puritanism in England, Victorian England and in the Anglican Church at that time. So while there, that was like the most probably uh, puritanical, sexually speaking and ethically speaking in England, you also have this undercurrent of a rebellion and, and a, un, a, a swelling up against that, which you had a lot of secret societies. This is where you get the rise of uh, mesmerism, seances, all this stuff starts getting really, really popular. And I think that's because there had always kind of been a pagan undercurrent it was just kind of on, on the down low, right? So uh, during the periods when, when England had these laws against witchcraft and against sorcery and against buggery, <laughs> which I'm sure you know what that is, these are all laws on the books that you know were probably in many cases enforced even up into the 1940s and 50s because they went after uh, Alan Turing for uh, being PEDO even up into the time of World War II because he was cut, cracking the codes of the tiny mustache man, but he was also like PEDO and buggery, buggery laws got him even that late. So, um, you know, this is, this is pretty serious stuff in Victorian England. So I think that you have this guy who supposedly is a scientist, um, but not really. It sounds like he probably also was interested in paganism. And so the idea that, you know, Darwinism, enlightenment, atheism, uh, uh, would somehow give man fulfillment is ironically shown to be false in this character who is supposed to be a scientist, but actually ends up we and can the presume, warm Gulf Stream, founding this pagan commune uh, on an island in the 1860s. So really, he's just way ahead of his time, right? Like he's mm -hmm. like he's a biohacking co communal bro, uh, you know, a <laughs> hundred years before everybody else. Yeah, and yeah, so so he had the idea to you know just return to the old ways, uh, and and that I think is in line with a lot of these characters who. Uh, Dame Frances Yates has a classic book on this. Uh, she, she was, I think, the British scholar who wrote on the Enlightenment as actually a, a pagan movement in that under the Enlightenment's public face of scientism and materialism, you had all these alchemical, esoteric, secret society movements, particularly the Rosicrucians. Yeah, that there's a book, were, there's a book, uh, the Rosicrucian... Yeah, so uh, what is it? The Rosicrucian Roots of the Enlightenment or something. I forget the title. It's called The Rosicrucian Enlightenment by Dame Francis Yates. It's yeah. A great yeah, I have a copy of it. I'm yet to delve into it. Uh, it starts with uh, covers covering um, John D. And then it moves into covering Frederick the Elector Palatine and, and uh, uh, Emperor Elizabeth Palpatine. Elizabeth. Yeah. Huh? Emperor, Emperor Palpatine. Palpatine. Yeah. For sure. And then it moves into covering Obi Wan Kenobi in his time period. And it's like, <laughs> right, right, Ben Kenobi. You guys probably know him as Ben, Ben Kenobi. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I almost said Saigon Jin. <laughs> Saigon Jin. Yeah, man. I was fighting over in Saigon and I had Jedi mind tricks, man. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, there's this undercurrent uh, in the lodges, right, of Freemasonry, people interested in alchemy. Of people interested in hermeticism. You mentioned earlier Shakespeare. Uh, uh, there's quite a bit of evidence that Shakespeare was very much into um, alchemy. And so a lot of the texts of Shakespeare literally used a lot of esoteric alchemical themes, um, hmm. maybe even uh, uh, Rosicrucian ideas. And if you, I had some pretty lengthy classes on or grad classes on Elizabethan alchemical literature. So this is an area I know quite a bit about. Uh, there's the poems of this time are crazy, right? This is what prepares the, for the Victorian period. No, the, Ma like, the Masons yeah. even tried to claim Shakespeare as yeah. right. You know, they, they actually, if you read Manly P. Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages, uh, there's this funny page where it shows Sir Francis Bacon, and then there's a transparent page right before it, and that's it. It, it basically shows that the uh, the the paintings of the bust of Shakespeare and Francis Bacon are identical. So the Masons claim that, you know, Francis Bacon was Shakespeare, in fact, and that, you know, all of yeah. his works were actually the works of Masonry. It's unclear whether, 
You know, I mean, they, they love to make these claims. They also make yeah, these man, claims. Man, like, oh, Jesus was a Mason. Everybody was a Mason. Yeah. Everybody, was, everybody was secretly a Mason. They, yeah. they, that, that book's kind of ridiculous because he claims that, like, there's a secret council of Masons behind every event in world history. Yeah, for, for thousands of years. Yeah, exactly. But right, the Lodge literally um, goes back to Pythagoras, right? Pythagoras was a Freemason. Uh, but they just, they, I, think, I think they co-opt these ideas and they yeah, exactly. claim ancient roots <clears throat> and they're just constantly recreating what they, you know, assume was going on and they, you know, they kind of, they mythologize them themselves. Yeah, another example of this is uh, Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, which is was originally intended to be the Elizabethan, like, it was the, uh, what Virgil's Aeneid was to Rome, like the official myth of the empire. It was going to be that to the British Empire. Um, it was so dense and esoteric that most people couldn't really vibe with it. Uh, but it's very famous as like a really super esoteric piece of literature. And it's full of what we're talking about, right? I mean, it's reincarnation, it's hermeticism, it's all the things that, that you think of. So this was like super, super popular from the time of Elizabeth up until the time that we're talking about. I think that undergirds the idea that this grandfather character was in those circles, maybe even the Royal Society circles. Exactly. And then he decides to go off and kind of start his own, uh, you know, religious commune. Yeah, well, almost we, like an experiment, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, beyond that, we even get these really weird um, hybridizations, which reminds me of the ancient uh, Greek. There's a great chapter in the <clears throat> Russian is one of the many where he covers the ancient rituals of chaos. And in one of the one of the rites of the, the Greeks had this ritual where they would reenact primordial chaos. And it... Mm. It, it included every form of degeneracy you could think of. So, for example, the men would dress up like women. The women would dress up like men. They would put on beards. What a novel idea. Um, we, where have we ever seen any of these ideas? That's I mean, what that's, I'm saying. Oh, my goodness. And these are like Bacchanalia-type services and rituals. Yeah. Uh, and so you'll notice in the movie they have a, a man-woman, a man-animal, a man-fool. Uh, Christopher Lee eventually puts on a half-man, half-woman outfit. He looks like a woman. Yep. And he's supposed to be the hermaphrodite. And that's because this ritual is the blending of all things back to primordial chaos to, in their pagan mind, restart the cycle. So yeah. it's a cyclical view. It's restarting the cycle. And Christopher Lee embodies that with that. Because um, you're watching it and, you're, and I've forgotten that element. I'm like, it's interesting because at least I said, I was said as Jamie and I were watching it this last time, I was like, these pagans are at least not going into full on like hermaphrodite, you know, trans mode. And then there they are. <laughs> they do. Yeah, they totally do. <laughs> <laughs> they fully do. Yeah, they, they say that, we're, well, we don't believe in death like you believe in death. You know, you die, you become a part of the trees, you become part of the soil, you become a part yeah. of the air, you know, you're everywhere. So it's kind of this almost monistic idea absolutely it's also a king kill ritual are you familiar with that yes yeah the, the murder of the king ritual exactly now um we did a lengthy interview with people that i'm sure you we used to mutually know uh in that interview i think mm. got shelved it'll never be seen but we went pretty deep in that interview uh maybe five six years ago on um the ancient english british isles traditions of John Barleycorn and bringing the man, the bread man out and yeah. all of these rites, which in a lot of the British villages and countryside and, and islands that never went away. So even though Christ, Anglican Christianity and, you know, Catholicism and Orthodoxy prior to that had reached <clears throat> the UK, a lot of the villagers still kept these um, traditional folk ceremonies, but the folk ceremonies of the English Isles were, kind of the inheritance of these Celtic Druidic services, which do have a, a the human sacrifice component. And that's what this is all about, right? So we even see not just the John Barley, Barleycorn human-sized bread, which represents that we're going to feed on the human sacrifice, but mm -hmm. um, the uh, hand of glory, which, which I didn't expect to see in this, because I thought that was more of like a voodoo thing, where, you know what I'm talking about, the hand yeah. of glory? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they yeah they, well, they, they, they do it to put him to sleep, right? They put the, the so-called hand of glory in there. To, it's a severed human hand, and they put, they put candles on it or you something? They put candles and certain markings on it, and yeah. it has its own whole history behind that whole thing. But 
Yeah, and, and maybe they were just mixing together uh, a, a lot of... Well, it seems like they had a lot of historically accurate practices yeah, that they it's really it's distilled accurate. into this culture. So maybe not all these things were going on in the you know, the Scottish Hebrides Isles, but they're taking things from all over different Celtic culture, cultural right. hotspots and, and kind of amalgamating them into these practices here. Uh, the sword chop dance scene is interesting. Um, I'm not exactly sure what to, to make of that, but... It seems like the point was that they wanted a chaste virgin Christian male sacrifice. And that's interesting because Crowley says in one of his famous texts that a, uh, what does he say? Something like a, a male virgin, he yeah. says kid. A pure male which, virgin child. Which they is say the best is, oh, oh, it's just a goat, right? Um, so there might be that kind of Crowleyan element here as well. Uh, and then they have this, argument between him and Christopher Lee about well, you came of your own free will to this appointed place of your fate because they believe in the fates uh, as pagans and not in divine providence and sort of try to argue him into saying that why wouldn't you accept being the human sacrifice if you believe your religion because we'll make you a martyr you'll get to sit with your god and your your heavenly throne or whatever yeah um and then you can do us the favor of getting rid of the curse on our crops right so it's a really interesting exchange uh towards the end and of course he accepts that martyr's death but um yeah it's, it's almost a prophetic kind of film in terms of where the west is going with this return to paganism and perhaps even human sacrifice and then you get these manifestations of burning man and this kind of stuff like oh like, it's so cool dude like like the pig it's like why would you think that rolling around in dung and dressing up and by the way, the Saturnalian, Bacchanalian, I mean, that, that even included like bestiality stuff, right? So yeah. I'm not trying to get too gross, but I mean, it was like every form of inversion and blending of opposites is transgressing of all limitations and boundaries to restart primordial chaos. Okay. So this is just madness. Uh, you know, why would we want to return to this kind of a civilization destroying uh, worldview when... It's not going to be good for anybody. And it's actually a tool of the elite. Yeah. I absolutely. think we even get that theme in this movie, right? I mean, exactly. Well, with this being a tool of the elite, I mean, the, you know, this kind of I mean, royal he's society. Pretty, he's like a Scottish lord. He's like a lord nobility. Lord Summer Isle, who's, whose yeah. grandfather was an occultic, Masonic, yeah. Victorian scientist and occultist who was a right. free thinker. I mean, the, the, the term free thinker is specifically used there indicates a really specific milieu in the culture in Victorian England at the time who were, you know, dabbling in all sorts of strange practices. And you'll notice he doesn't live uh, in harmony with nature. He lives in a giant estate. Yeah. Well, you know what's interesting? I'm, I'm looking here. I've got this article pulled up from uh, what is it? Cine, Cine Fantastique, and it's an old article from 1976 or 7. And let's see. We've got a quote here. I think this is a quote from the director... He says, the, the power of the unseen. There are communities today that are not what they seem. Look at Freemasonry. Although I'm neither condemning it nor comparing it to a pagan religion, but it's a secret society in a benevolent sense with a highly organized set of beliefs and practices and has considerable power, at least to its members. The Wicker Man is not an attack on contemporary religion, but a comment on it, its strengths as well as its weaknesses, its fallibility, that it can be puritanical and won't always come out on top. Even the Christian religion is based on the execution and sacrifice of man, of one man, rather, it says. Uh, in that respect, there's no difference at all. Christ was sacrificed to appease the organized establishment and was condemned as a criminal, which is not the case with Howie. If anything, <clears throat> it was the establishment that Schaefer attacked in his script. Summer Isle embodies the pagan beliefs. He's responsible, the third generation, of the founding of it, for its being on the island. Part of the mysterious effect of the film is bound up with this fact and of the various scenes and descriptions of pagan ritual and actually taking place, uh, that actually take place in the film. So, yeah, so Hardy's talking about how, you know, one of the most interesting parts of it is it is the establishment who set this island up. It is the lords that set this up and is a multi-generation uh, effect of their worldview which is, of course, you know, kind of obsessed with a return to the old ways, kind of a return to paganism, and bringing about a new, uh, a, a you know, kind of the 
it's like a psyop of a new mythology mythologization of the old gods, right? They want to they want to bring back the old gods while pretending this is some sort of a new idea, right? So it's it's progress. This is enlightenment. This is the result of man's forward motion towards his development, towards his you know his uh, his, his evolution, and the the new gods, right, are the old gods. So it's you, they, they've created this sort of this whole idea of neo paganism. It's not even really a return to the old gods at all. Also, you know, in the way that we see it manifesting today, in the way that it is now, oh, Jay dropped off. Let's see if he jumps back. Um, in the way that it is, the way that it is now, it's not the. All right, he's coming right back. It's not <clears throat> neo paganism. Isn't really a return. It is a resurgence of a lot of the same ideas, similar forms, similar ideas, but done in a new way that's actually way, uh, that, that's actually far more, it's, it's disconnected, right? So you see like the, the guys trying to recreate Odinism and go back to what they think is the, is kind of the, the their Viking roots, right? Uh, they're completely disconnected from their so-called Viking roots, their ancestors. So they'll exalt their ancestors. They'll talk about how great the, the ways of the ancestors are. But at the same time, they have no idea what the ancestors were doing. They don't know what they were doing. They don't know what their, uh, where their practices even came from. And they're basically, they're, they're really kind of worshiping like Marvel superhero characters. To a certain extent, there was this post on Twitter not that long ago of one of these neo pagans. Um, one of these neo pagans, or right, Jay's back. Sorry, guys, Jay's back. Um, there was a post on Twitter recently of this neo pagans kind of prayer corner, and it was it was super goofy. Jay, did you see that one? The uh, it was like um, he had a bowl of milk so that Thor could drink, so Thor could drink that milk. He had a um he had these like Amazon.com purchased statues of Thor and he was that was this uh there's some neo pagan post on Twitter. I forget. I, I, I don't think I'll be able to pull it up now. But it was it was completely goofy. It was kind of like a you know, return to to the ways of your ancestors. But he had a he had a bowl of milk and uh this like fake plastic statue, or maybe it was actually made of stone of Thor and all these, it looked just like a Christian icon corner, except adapted to, you know, <laughs> this like modern idea of return. We got to return to the old ways. And what I was saying when you uh, when you rage quit for a minute there, uh, which is fine, it's perfectly it's perfectly fine to quit and rage cry. Um, that these people think they're connecting to their ancestors, but they're really just it's a recreationist thing. They're not it's a made really, up thing. There is no ancient Disney. tradition that you link into. In fact, uh, one thing that's funny about this tradition of like Wotan and Odin and all that stuff is like, you know, they'll say oh, Christianity is a stupid religion. It's a borrow from a bunch of other religions. And then you're like, well, you know, didn't Odin die on a tree? <laughs> right. I mean, you're, you make fun of your, your God died. It's like, yeah, but Odin dies on a tree. So wait a minute. Uh Oh, oops. Right. <laughs> so it's very arbitrary and what they pick and choose in terms of like commonalities amongst religions and hmm. part of their religion has this ridiculous story of like people fighting over a weed i'm, I'm dead so there's like there's a squirrel that like fights with odin a or weave? One of the gods like a, a nappy weave. ass weave a nap i'm serious a nappy ass weave Squirrel's like you may give me that nappy ass weave no, the squirrel's like, a little uh, squirrel being like give me that weave and then odin's like you can't have the weave hey we need we need like a that's going to be the next wakanda film um, you can it could be like a Disney Pixar, uh, Pixar production about it's perfect for Disney. They should Wotan, make that. yeah, and, then, and we can have Black Panther, Panther can end up getting the weave, and then and putting it on his on his on his uh his chick, <laughs> and then she will get powers. She'll get superpowers. But we were saying oh, before, God. I think they should make they should remake an African version of Wicker Man. Like that would be that would be freaking base, like a w w Wakanda Wicker Man. No, no, no. We we know what it should obviously be. Wig, wig, yeah, yeah, Wigger Man. Exactly. It's it'd be Wigger Man, and it would be okay, so who listen. would it be? 
It would be I Sean King. Joking. Sean King would be the the Wicker Man, the innocent sacrifice. Exactly. <laughs> Eminem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'd be Sean King, and then like, but he would uh, he would he would try to infiltrate. He would come to Wakanda, and and they would <laughs> they would just they would just gradually breadcrumb him into being their sacrifice. In Norse mythology, Rata Tosker, which is the old Norse for squirrel. <laughs> runs up and down. Listen, he runs up and down the world tree of Yggdrasil to carry the to carry the messages between the eagles perched at the top and the serpent at the bottom, and then he gets into a fight over uh, hair that has been uh, woven, a weave, between him and another god. <laughs> so, Amazing. so like anytime they try to uh, you know play the R A C E card, if you're a neo pagan, be like, dude, your gods fight over weaves. What are you talking about? I mean, you know, you haven't seen the weave though. To be fair, like you don't exactly. know, you don't know how great that weave was. Well, I mean, weave, this dude dude. right here, like that's a he's gonna have a pretty sweet weave by the end of the day. Dang, right? dude! Christianity debunked. Who do you think would win in a fight? All right, you guys. Who do you, who do you think would win in a fight over that weave? Would it would it be Sean King? Or uh, or um, <coughs> or Shaquille O'Neal, like Shaq as Shazam. Shaq Shaq as Shazam. He would actually be the Wicker Man, and he would he would swallow Sean King whole, and then he would be burned inside of Shaq. Do you think that? Do you think I get that funded? Maybe I could direct that. How about Cat Williams as Odin? Cat, he's got the hair. And then he's fighting. Uh, Chris Tucker is. They're the fighting squirrel. for Cat Williams weave. Right, and it's Chris Tucker plays the squirrel god, and they have a fight over a weave. Chris Tucker would be the perfect squirrel god. That's genius. <laughs> All right, hold on. I'm going to delete this before somebody tries to plagiarize this. We're selling this one for sure. This because look, hey, Netflix one. loves to you know make the updated woke versions of these myths. Let's just roll with it. Let's have the updated you know Odin myth. Dude, I love it. I love it. We're gonna be we're gonna be zillionaires. Um. All right, let me let me come over here. Shout out our sponsors in the chat. See me. Let me remind the chat. Look at look at you bigots in the chat. What's up? We got we got Jamie Hanshaw. Jamie Hanshaw sending the first super chat. Said sing the mating song. Come how do? Thank you very much, Jamie. The the uh, Technoir graphics also sent four ninety nine. Says for your mental health. You guys make sure to drop those super chats if you feel so inclined. There is uh, the best way to super chat, of course, is Streamlabs. Streamlabs does not take a cut like YouTube does. You know, I know it's the what's the, it's the beginning of the month. We got we got stingy crowd at the beginning of the month. So usually those super chats are a little bit stronger, but it's all good. It's all good. You guys are too busy, too busy um, being enlightened by our our ideas about the future Wakanda universe films. So um, if you guys want to crowdfund that, it is gonna it's not gonna be cheap to get Chris Tucker to play that squirrel. Uh, Cat Williams actually getting his weave. That is not going to be cheap because he is in high demand right now after his appearance on Joe Rogan. Um, also, guys, make sure to support yourself and support your own health by hitting up our sponsors over at Chalk.com. Chalk.com got the highest quality adaptogens and natural supplements to help get your hormones balanced while it is still legal. While it's still legal not to be uh, fake and gray hey, you can head over to chalk.com, optimize your hormones, enhance your energy levels. They got a lot of awesome products. We wouldn't shill it if we didn't take it. 53% off all subscriptions for life over at chalk.com. That's 53% off all subscriptions for life. Uh, I'm a really big fan of the, they got the Chad mode pre-workout, 100% natural pre-workout right here. You can see the bottle itself is a work of art. My camera refuses to focus. It almost broke. The camera is afraid to focus on it because it might break the lens because of how based this is. Got that little Chad guy there in the D. Bring the thunder. That pre-workout, 100% natural pre-workout. If you look at the ingredients of it, it's, it's actually really awesome. There's no artificial sweeteners, no artificial flavors, no fake coloring, none of that stuff. It doesn't even have those fake... A lot of the times these pre-workouts, they'll say natural flavors. Well, natural flavors can be basically anything, right? Like you can use, uh, for vanilla, they use, they use freaking beaver anal glands. Now, I know like Jay's a big fan that, of that. That comes from nature. 
Yeah, it's natural. Beaver, beaver anal glands to get vanilla flavor. Why don't you just use freaking vanilla bean? Well, chalk's not about any of that stuff. Uh, if you look at the ingredients on here, it's actually really awesome. It gets that blue color from a spirulina extract. It's got an organic coffee extract, 150 milligrams organic caffeine. Uh, so it's not like overdosed on caffeine. It doesn't make you feel all twacked out. It's not going to have you twitching and tweaking. Uh, it's actually a healthy dose there. It's got that Makuna prurien seed extract. Makuna actually helps to sensitize your dopamine receptors because we know that, you know, after watching a stream like this, you've, your, your dopamine receptors have been completely fried from the dopeness of everything you're hearing from, from our friend Jay Dyer and myself over here. So you're going to be, you're going to be overloaded with, with extreme knowledge about Wakanda and in our new film project starring <coughs> Cat Williams Weave and Chris Tucker as the squeaky squirrel. And uh, so uh, you can actually help to sensitize your dopamine receptors with that, that green coffee bean extract, the L-citrulline, which is fermented to make it more bioavailable. I love that, that natural pre-workout. The Chad mode is awesome. You don't even have to work out to take it. If you don't have time to make yourself a cup of joe in the morning, you don't have your time to make yourself a pot of coffee. Uh, if you've already had five pots of coffee and you just want something different, that Chad mode is great. I'm also a big fan of the daily the daily, I take that on the daily. It's got the, uh, it's got that shilajit extract. It also has a tribulus extract, which is known to help to improve testosterone levels in men. Uh, the makuna is also in that daily and a cacao extract. So it gives you energy. It's got that purified shilajit. Uh, and the Tongkat 100 is great too. So I suggest. Why don't, you, why don't you tell us how many pots you had instead of how pots many, of coffee? How many pots Jay be smoking over there? How many pots there? did you do today? Yeah. Sure. So you guys, we're not talking about the kind of pots that Jay does over there with his long hair and his puka shells over there yeah, trying yeah. to. Yeah, you know, Jay, before we even started this, Jay's like, hey, dude, do I look high? Do I look high? I'm like, dude, Jay, stop. He's all, every time he's like, just, uh, do I look high, man? I can't do the show because I did too many pots this morning. He's injecting his marijuana cigarettes again. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, hit, hit him up over at chalk.com, C-H-O-Q.com, and use that coupon code BIG53LIFE to get 53% off all subscriptions. That's for subscriptions only, where they'll send it to your house Every 28 days, you don't have to think about re-upping. You don't have to think about it. You just get it, take it, reap the benefits. 53% off all subscriptions for life. It will cure your soy face instantly. It is 100% 100% remission of soy face will be achieved using that coupon code. Big 53 life. There you go. Exactly. From from Soy Jack to Giga Chad. Guaranteed. To Giga Mac. Soy Giga Jack Mac. to Giga Mac. Giga Mac. Use that coupon code Big Fifty Three Life over at chalk.com, chlq.com for fifty three percent off all subscriptions for life. Also, every time you make a purchase over there, we've got it automated to where they will send a mean email to Jay telling him how mean he is and uh, and lambasting him for his his super meanness, which is another benefit too. Bubbling over with Tristan's toxicity in every email. Yes, yes, it will actually increase my my toxicity which is is just you know over already the top. pretty like we're maxed out i mean yeah we're like 99 yeah, we've got 100. dogs crying i don't even i don't even know dogs could crying cry. boogers Christmas dogs are now crying weeping weeping literally literally weeping they don't even they don't even normally cry um so all right where were we at we were at the part let's see are we at Nick Cage, or did you want to say anything? Well, yeah, we could we could jump into the Nick Cage. I mean, <coughs> we've kind of we've kind of summed up, I think, a majority of the important points of this movie. I'm glad you liked it. This <coughs> this was uh, what a movie you said you had not ever gotten around to, right? Well, you I mean, we talked about doing this one long so time. long ago. Yeah, and I down I I'd had this one loaded up and ready to watch for like three four years, and I'm glad we finally got to it. You know, Jay's been on a roll with his movie recommendations. I mean, you had this one. What was the other one you had us watch recently? Um, uh, the the AI movie Ex Machina that was oh, a good Ex one Machina, too yeah yeah Ex Machina was good we also did uh, There Will Be Blood I feel like we've yeah, we great. haven't done bad movies in a while so now we've we got to move on to Nicolas Cage's Wicker Man which is so enjoyable well we this is an area bad. where Tristan and I disagree uh, I I love this movie it is not a bad movie it is <laughs> dude it's so bad it is one of the best uh, horror movies ever all right can you you're gonna have to you're gonna have to know what you hate this movie. movie. The hate is just from memes. Everybody just jumped on the meme train of look. Oh, I also hate the Nick Cage Wicker Man because of the memes. No, 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 dude. This is a genius movie. 
hate all right. this movie. What is redeeming? All right, the, this is this movie is good in the way that Leprechaun Five Lep in the Hood is good. Well, that's, a, that's I'll say that. That's what. I, all right, that all right. So I agree with you there. I mean, a movie um, number one. If a movie's entertaining, why are you expecting? Why are you expecting this? Well, the this original Wicker Man was a. It was a cerebral film. The original Wicker Man. It's like there's great acting. The costume design is fantastic. It's it, the writing is amazing. This one, it's like you're laughing the whole way, but you're not supposed to be laughing. The, the, the intention is not to make maybe, you laugh. Maybe not. <laughs> you think that, yeah, I mean, if this was branded as a comedy movie, I'm down. It's like a, li- it's like a lifetime. It's a lyrical re- replay. Of Bro, this, is, this, this, this like, movie. Look, is... This Wicker Man is like too trippy and psychologically intense. Let's make this shit into a satire. I mean, if you go watch Con Air, by the way, I mean... Con Air is so preposterous that it has to be. It's a satire, I think, of like action movies because it's so dumb. I mean, I don't remember Con Air. I don't know if I've ever watched Con Air. I know I know some of the images from it. I don't know if I've ever watched the actual. Oh man, you you should. It's like it's a study all on its own, just on the absurdity of like you know '90s blockbuster. You know, I mean, Nicolas Cage has a terrible Southern accent, but it's actually I love it. It's so bad. It's like. Dear, I hope you got those ho hos and bunnies that I sent you in the mail. I'll never meet you because I'm fucking in jail. I mean, it's just like terrible. <coughs> he's writing to his daughter while he's in jail. It's awesome. It's great. I think Jay's just like, a, you're a huge Nick Cage fan. This is why you like the him. movie. You like anything that Nicolas Cage is in. Something about Nicolas Cage bothers me, though. And I think what, what bothers me about Nick Cage is probably what makes you like Nick Cage. He's, I feel like. He's hilarious in that you, he seems like he takes himself so seriously in these films. And, and almost all the movies that he makes are, are kind of... I mean, what, what's a really good... Uh, Leaving Las Vegas, other than Leaving Las Vegas, what's a good role he played? Uh, adaptation, right? Um, that was oh, really a, good. There's a bunch. I can give you a bunch of really Give me a few of, more, because I can't think of... Uh, I'm trying okay. to think of... The, the, uh, uh, the Martin Scorsese... Uh, uh, where Nick Cage is an EMT. That's an awesome movie. I haven't seen but, it. Yeah, I haven't seen oh, that Oh, it's one. great. It's a great movie. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll pull it up in a second. Something something the dead. Um, the uh, Werner Herzog, Bad Lieutenant, awesome Nick Cage movie. Okay, I also haven't seen it. Maybe I haven't seen all the good Nick Cage movies. That's my problem. I mean, these are, yeah, these are, these are great. Uh, dude, there's, there, uh, he was great in um, uh, Mandy. Great, great Nick Cage movie. Horror also movie. haven't seen it yet. Oh, dude, right. You got uh, me, man. I just haven't seen a lot of, a lot of people are not huge fans of uh, what's the HP Lovecraft, the uh, Colorado space. I love, I thought Colorado space was great. Um, there's actually a really good drama that he's in uh, where he plays a dad. That's like an independent drama called Joe. Great Nick Cage. Movie. There's, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch. Now he's in like so many movies that, yeah, there's several that are like, terrible but all right so they, he just he does so many movies that a lot of them end up really bad this one is it's an endearing movie and that is really funny bad like it's it's terribly the the script is awful none of the none of the characters reactions or especially nick cage stuff will happen and a character will portray some information to him and his response it doesn't it never makes sense like why would you respond in that way he gets told that uh rowan is his daughter right this is one of the major changes in the film rowan is actually his daughter who he had been catfished into having with this uh this woman who had apparently seduced yeah him, he you know? got he becomes cuckless cage from that hippie chick yeah so the hippie chick she cucks him and and instead of a neo-pagan or a, you know a kind of british celtic pagan group they're a bunch of health food hippies in Washington state. I love this. Yes. That's they're I like, do like that. They're like yeah, they're like Instagram yoga. <laughs> right now, <clears throat> I forgot to mention too at the well, we'll get to this at the end of this one, but um there's somebody else weird involved in this movie too, like somebody from like Alice Cooper or some like somebody from um uh kiss like it ends up being a producer for this movie. So there's something ridiculous. <laughs> I like miss that. that. Yeah. I forget who it was, but um I was going to tell you the name of that movie. Uh, have you seen Lord of War? That's actually like a really deep Yeah, Lord of War was good. That was really good. It was funny play. and it was yeah, self-aware. Uh, that was good. Have one. you seen Matchstick Man? That's a great movie. No. Oh, dude, that's yeah, that's really good. Did you see National Treasure 1 and 2? Uh, I think I saw the first one. It wasn't that in. I mean, it was it was oh, fun. That. That's like it's Masonry. A fun movie. 
those are conspiracy classics. I mean, they're goofy, but um, Family Man, that's actually a good wholesome Nick Cage movie. Family Man, Have I've you seen, seen uh, the talk about like deep occult mind control? Have you seen 8mm? Yes. Yeah. 8mm with Joaquin Phoenix. Right? Joaquin's no. in there. No, is he in that? He might yeah, be. dude. Joaquin Phoenix is in 8mm. That's the one about, you know, you're right, you're right. about Joaquin's the, the films. You're right. Uh, it's about the S N U F F. Yeah. 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 Joaquin Phoenix um, is like the second. It's like the you're right. supporting actor. I apologize. I got distracted because I was really distracted. Wild at Heart, uh, great Nick Cage, uh, David Lynch movie. I'm trying to find the really good uh, Martin Scorsese movie where he's a uh, EMT driver. And he's any he, any anytime he can play like this crazy guy, he does good. Let's see how much the uh, chat hates me hating on Nick Cage. Did you yeah, see I expect the, full the mutiny knowing? in the chat right now. A lot of Which people one? hate the knowing, but it was like a super. Oh, dude, the knowing was great. That movie's yeah. hilarious, okay. and it was. It's hard to find now. It's not. It wasn't really popular. It was like 2009, right? That sounds right. Yeah, that the knowing that was a really crazy kind of new age ascension, uh, yes. end times prophecy. Yeah. Uh, it was almost like 2012 style. And it was it was leading up to 2012 when it came out, and there was a lot of stuff in there. There was a lot of stuff well, in there. It was kind the, of predictive the, programming. Uh, oil and, disaster, but before the oil disaster in yep. down here in the in the, uh, the bringing Gulf. out the dead. I'm sorry, that's the really good Martin Scorsese Nick Cage movie. Ah, uh, I never saw that. Yeah, that's I remember really the trailer where he's he's an he's EMT a, guy who goes yeah. nuts. Yeah, he's driving the ambulance. Um. Okay, I apologize. Yeah, so so you're here uh, at the beginning. I, so one thing I didn't notice until this time, I told you before we started, there's several elements in this one. I've seen this movie probably five times. Um, I, I, there's several things I, I miss. For example, the burning up of the car in the beginning foreshadows the burning up of Nick Cage at the end. Uh, yes. And I, had not, I had not noticed that. His name is... Uh, something malice <laughs> malice which is which is a combination of male and phallus <laughs> or malice in the sense of malicious sure right? sure men are malicious but it's spelled m a l u s right but this but in literature a lot of times you can have a play i don't know how to not, read so yeah explain to me well not just the spelling but the phonet like how it's of course right yeah like it's a it's a ho you call it a homophone a homophobe i think it's called right a homo yeah. homophobe right <laughs> Then you have uh, malice could also refer to the malleus maleficarum, right? So this is the the famous ah famous yes that doc get in let's get into that one a little bit because this one is more pro pagan and anti Christian in some ways. This film, uh, well, I actually think it's inadvertently anti feminist because we don't come away from this. I don't think feeling like, um, well, I need to support the witch commune. I mean, they're human sacrificing people. So. True, but but when they say they're there because their ancestors were fleeing, they, she, she, she alludes to fleeing persecution because of the Salem witch trials and the mean right. Christians. So that's that's kind of, yeah, you, I, you're, you're, you're right, but there is that. There's an undercurrent of kind of, well, they're fleeing persecution from the mean Christians, but the main character, Nicolas Cage, is not a Christian. No, anyway. actually, he's supposed to be a Christian because if you notice at the beginning when he's doing his um, internet looking up at his house, he's got a big crucifix right behind him. And so they intentionally had that behind oh, that's him. That's interesting. I missed that's, that I one. Just, but he's like kind of a lax, lazy Christian. But he's because lax, he, you're correct. And yeah. he, he's, he's lax. Because if you notice in the opening scene, when he's looking through the, the books, he finds like an, a book on tape of Everything's Okay by some self-help Tony Robbins guru. Yeah. So, uh, and all the books, if you look at all the books on there, it's like, what is yeah. it? It's, it's Victor Frankel's <laughs> Man's Search the, for the Meaning. The Jewish uh, Victor Frankel. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of like, weird self-help stuff. So And a bunch of self-help stuff and like, you know, stuff with butterfly imagery and like um, not not overt New Age books, but kind of, you know, uh, sl slippery slope to the New Age channeling Positive type books. Positive thinking, Norman Vincent Peale type stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. Which is a, a gateway to that stuff. You're exactly right. Um so the, the burning car scene at the beginning, we noticed that, uh, you know, this is some kind of witchery, right? He's he's already under some kind of curse, some kind of spell has been put on him. And we, be, we, we begin to think that it probably relates to something prior to this event, right? There, there's something going on. We later find out that um, 
Willow chose uh, Nick Cage to be her breeder. And uh, I like the element of men sort of being cucked and being breeders in this. Yeah, well, you're uh, only because, useful to us for breeding, he gets for, told yeah. by the... And instead of Lord Summer Isle, you have Lady Summer Isle. So it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's the, the matriarchy. So the matriarchy to matriarchy. Which does reflect, I mean, if you look at these two films together, you do see the trajectory of where American culture, Western culture has gone uh, since the original was made in that, you know, the, the, the takeover of kind of, you know, feminist ideals, the matriarchy. She talks about how, well, the, uh, the sacred feminine was oppressed and this yes. is why we do this. And we have, we live here under the mother goddess and the mother, go mother goddess is everything. And, um, so it doesn't give, they don't have a really, a very accurate portrayal of, you know, any true pagan, um, cultures as the original wicker man really seems to maintain kind of a you know almost a uh a quite realistic portrayal of paganism this one is more it's more hippy dippy new age well they're wiccans right i mean they're basically yeah like, which is what wicca is wicca is like new right. age new age it's a, paganism. And, it's, and it's a modern invention it comes from um gerald gardner who studied under crowley mm. and gardner just made up wicca it's like a totally invent, <laughs> an invented thing from him which is ironic because it's not from a woman <laughs> right it's like mm -hmm. goddess worship from some dude who just wanted to you know what sam tripoli says sleep with fat goth chicks literally that, that was the whole thing that <laughs> gerald gardner was up to um so yeah we begin to see that uh these are like neo-pagan uh, or these, these are uh, wiccan goddess chicks up in oregon i like that it was located up in like super this is exactly where this weirdo communion commune would be <laughs> like up in washington oregon yeah. area, area. yeah um, we noticed that, uh, every woman in the movie, as they interact with Nick Cage, typically, and they, they manipulate him with their feminine wiles and they're not uh, opposed <laughs> to using that. And that's actually something that Wicca and even like, sa Satanism from the LeVay school, like they actually tell you to do this, right? Uh, LeVay has a whole book on how women can capitalize on and, uh, manipulate and empower themselves through using their sexuality as a tool. Yeah, and, and remember how this this completely ties in with espionage, with yes. intelligence gathering, blackmail, and all of this, which has always been a crucial part of, you know, the post enlightenment control structure. Mm -hmm. And they do weave in in these a lot of these blackmail rings involve sort of you know ritualistic drug use. Yeah. Uh, the blackmail rings it's themselves sometimes become almost ritualistic in the way that they're you know drawing people into these honeypots so that's, that's well, some of them aspect. actually use sex cults uh, yeah i mean yeah absolutely. a lot of them do exactly and so the, and, and that easily flips over into um you know nexium uh we can think of the finders we can think of uh savile we can think of right. uh, franklin cover up uh, epstein uh, i mean i don't know that epstein had a cult connections necessarily but well, he did have his own area he had that place in the the ranch out in new mexico i feel like that the new mexico ranch is really overlooked in the epstein case um it was almost like a strange <coughs> west world type thing that he had going on out there with larping um and yeah. he was obsessed with uh you know kind of impregnating as many women as he could so there is this strange kind of cult sex cult type aspect yeah i him. won't be surprised if hard evidence of like a connection to the occult pops up in Epstein. I just don't know that it's confirmed yet. And I could yeah. just not note about the actual... There, there seem to be indications that he did right. dabble in that type of stuff. So basically, uh, this is like, f you know, Femme Island here that Nick Cage is being lured to. And uh, what's interesting is the main point in all this is just that throughout this, we're noticing that Nicolas Cage is actually weak. And his weakness as a man which I understand the motivations of the film probably were feminist, but I think it's inadvertently kind of makes feminism look ridiculous because Nicolas Cage, the only reason that he in this, this story ends up being a, a sacrifice is because of the weakness. He keeps giving into the feminine wiles. He keeps being manipulated and he never wants to, to accept that Willow, uh, even Rowan, all the women on the Island. And then the, the cop that he works with, who ends up being one of the people from the island, mm -hmm. he never accepts that they might be manipulating. He just gives them the benefit of the doubt. He's like super beta throughout the whole movie and never stands his ground. So even though he doesn't morally compromise in terms of 
uh, you know, sleeping with Lily Sobieski or anything like that, uh, who kind of corresponds to the temptation girl from the first one a little bit. Um, even though he doesn't sexually <laughs> fall, he still gives in to even Willow, who he shouldn't give in to because she ran away from him. And we don't get the impression that he did anything wrong for her to run away and take their kid away to somewhere else. She just ran off and he just keeps giving and giving and giving and never, he gets mad, but he doesn't stand his ground on any principle. He keeps uh, conceding. So the, I like the fact that uh, he, he becomes cuckless cage because he never stands his ground. Yeah, no, he's, he's a totally, he's a very weak and naive character and, you know, throughout the whole film, he's uh, one of the things that doesn't make sense too. he's a cop from, I think he's in California or where, where is he a police officer? Yeah, he's in California. The cop in California. And he goes completely outside of his jurisdiction to, um, to, to Oregon where he has no authority, no right to be doing any police work. And he, well, you know, does to be fair though, I think that we're, we're supposed to think that Nick might suspect that it's his daughter and that's why he's doing it. Okay. Because yeah. They, well, they Rowan, who wrote this letter to play on his emotions to get him to come help her. And even though she doesn't initially say in the letter, he's thinking that could be my daughter that she ran off with. I want yeah. To they should have, they needed to throw a thread in there. Uh, they needed to, to bait that one a little bit better because yeah, I don't, I think, I think it was, it was lacking some writing in, in, in that regards, but yeah, I think he, he goes there as a police officer, acts like he's on official police business, but really has no legal jurisdiction. And one of the kind of tropes in the film is they talk about, well, this is private property. Yeah. You know, we're, we're just, you know, this is our, you know, libertarian paradise where we're creating exactly. our, our health food, uh, you know, organic farm uh, sex cult. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, the people there, it's mostly women, right? And the women are in charge and the men don't speak really. The men are just slave labor. They're basically they're, eunuchs. Yeah, they're eunuchs who are not allowed they to speak. speak. They're not taught to speak and they don't ever do anything other than servile labor. So they're literally mm -hmm. eunuchs. And, you know, later on, uh, the Ellen Burstyn Queen Bee character says, oh, we actually abort most of the, of the men unless we need <laughs> a, a worker or a breeder they get aborted. Yeah. So, and the, the bee imagery, the bee is a major symbol in this, the hive, um, the beehive, the hive mind, Nicholas Cage, of course, being the drone bee who is only used for sexual procreation, physical labor, and then ultimately lives a very short life. And the drone bees are just there to feed the queen. The drone bees are there to feed the femmes, the femme, uh, the, the superior femme. It's also uh, symbolic, too, that he has an allergy to bees, right? Like that mm -hmm. is now a weakness to him. He's allergic to the very thing that he is now the servant to, the queen bee. So The bees. Um, and that becomes funny because, as we were pointing out, one of the flaws in the plot is, like, if you're so allergic to bees that you carry an EpiPen, after being stung by the bees and the witches heal you, it, why would you be walking around in the bee garden <laughs> without any more epipens? Right? I mean, like, Dude, like yeah. this is gonna kill you. Like, and he's still swatting the bees, right? Um, so that that was kind of silly. But I, there's I think so many again, there's so many things like this in the movie where there's there's a complete there's a real incongruence between what Cage's character is experiencing, what somebody says to him, and then his response. It's just like, you just, there's so many laugh out loud moments where you're like, yeah. why would you respond that way? You just got told you have a daughter and you're just like, oh. Here's, <laughs> okay. the, here's the thing though, uh, in defense, this is my uh, right. uh, attempt at defending it. I think what we're supposed to think, and it might've been badly conveyed, is that because he's reading or listening to these self-help tapes called everything is okay. He knows that like sh sh shit is like messed up, right? There, yeah. Nothing is okay, but he's so convinced that he, he can make it okay. And if he chooses to believe against all the evidence that he can sort of just cope. Right. But there's nothing, there's no piece of evidence. And this is the irony is that he's a terrible cop. Because if he's a police officer and he's investigating crimes, he's literally missing every piece of evidence. Why? Because as the father, the potential father figure, the first worst horror that he could conceive of is that Rowan might be the sacrifice. 
And it's even worse than that. It's an even worse horror because not only is Rowan not the sacrifice, this is worse, I would argue. His daughter is in on it with the wife and everyone else. That's even worse because that means the daughter is now compromised and wicked and he's in, a, he's in an, an unsolvable situation. He can never get out of this. And so that I think is a worse horror than even just Rowan being the sacrifice. That's my apologetics. My no, I, I, you're <laughs> right. You are right. If, if you're to just write down a summary of the plot and what happens, this could, you could make this movie creepy, frightening, actually, you know, kind of a horror movie, but in, it, there's just the execution is so funny, <laughs> right? Like, it yeah, it's a horrible funny. story as far as, you know, it's a horrific <laughs> story, but the execution is just absolutely hilarious. Um, I forgot to mention, too, another Shakespearean element. You know, when he first arrives to the island, uh, you see these three witches, and the three witches confront him. This is a very Shakespearean Macbeth the three weird woman uh, situation, the three fates. Mm -hmm. And they kind of reveal to him in this initial encounter when he gets there. And that this isn't actually out of left field because there's actually a, several more prominent literary references in, in this movie. For example, the school teacher references Don Quixote. She calls him quixotic uh, because he sort of mm -hmm. is this out of place chivalrous character and the chivalry doesn't match up at all to reality like Don Quixote, right? Because the, the William um, Blake reference as well around that, in that Blake same is scene. literary reference, exactly. So there are, there's a little more, I think, uh, intelligence on the part of the writer than, than we might want to give them credit. So these three witches are there. So it's the end. director's fault. It's kind of the director's fault. Could be, yeah, the, 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 the witches represent the fates. And so the idea of the witches, like in Macbeth, they actually foretell uh, Macbeth's doom. Likewise, these three women that initially meet Nick Cage when he gets there, they kind of tell him like what's going on mm. because they're holding that bag of a, you know, beat up animal, whatever it is, a deer or whatever that's yeah. bleeding. And then we find out later in the film, Nick Cage is in this bag when they're taking him to the sacrifice. Right. So they're, they're doing this sort of revelation of the method for telling, you know, saying, Nick, baby, you're destined to be our sacrifice. Who else could it be? It's going to be mm -hmm. you. So he's just, again, terrible cop, uh, ignoring all the evidence, I think, because he doesn't want to see the evidence. No, of course. I mean, it's, it's, a horrible, it's a horrible thing. Of course you would block it out. And, you know, he had this traumatic, there, in the beginning of the movie, it shows him um, having this traumatic experience where he pulls somebody over. Uh, this lady's driving. I think she had no license plate, an unregistered vehicle, and a bunch of stuff strapped to the top of the vehicle. And the little girl in the car... She like throws a doll out and he goes She's to get the doll. Him too. Like, and that's, yeah. that's, that's part of that feminism. Right. He's being mocked. Like, yeah. He's being mocked by this kind of witchy little girl. That's got kind of a, you know, a little bit of a, um, like the girl in the shining kind of a vibe, you know, like creepy little blonde chick. And yeah. she throws the doll out. He goes to get it while he's going to grab the doll to bring it back to the car. A uh, massive 18 wheeler just bashes this thing and destroys uh, destroys it and the car ends up blowing up which is like it's it's a volvo and there's, just, there's so many little details that are really funny like in this in this scene he's at the back of this volvo it's kind of like the 80s volvo where the it's got the hatchback kind of a hatchback mom mom car and he uh and there's an explosion out of the back of the, tr the car for some reason. I don't know if this, this car was rigged up with explosives, but yeah, it blows up out the back of it where there's no engine. There's nothing, there's no combustible material back there. Um, so there's well, a lot of little a things. Spell. This is all, it's all witchcraft. It's not real because mm. they don't find any bodies. There's no evidence of this at, later on. And That's so, true. so he's, he's in a fever dream almost. He's yeah. having a vision. doesn't really happen. And then it cuts to him. And of course, uh, we were talking about before the stream and in classic Hollywood fashion, what do you do when you have a traumatic experience in a Hollywood movie? Well, you open up a pill bottle, you take a pill and you and have instant relief. You, you receive solace. Right? Immediately. You're, you're good. It's all good. You took your happy pills. You're legit. So, um, yeah, he's got this PTSD, but he just pops a pill every once in a while and he's good when he really starts to feel it. Well, but the pills are a crutch, right? Because his character is not wanting to face up to the delusion. And yes. the real trauma is that Willow ran away, right? Um, that's what he's really dealing with. And so the spell craft that caused him to have this fever dream of the girl and the, and the station wagon and all that, you'll notice that next what we see is the police officer that's his coworker 
who pretends to care for him, she's one of the witches. Mm -hmm. And she comes over and, you know, she's this very masculine looking woman, police officer with like, you know, jawline and everything. And she's like, are you okay? And I just want to come check on you. And, Hmm. you know, and she's actually getting intel to figure out, you know, is he ready to be, you know, given the next stage, which is the letter from Rowan. Uh, So when we find out later on that she was on the island, we can read back into that and feel and realize that she might have even been behind the witchcraft of him having this vision. She could have slipped him something. You know, she could have done something to cause the, the the vision or she could have covered it up if there was a real accident because she's the one that tells Nick, I think, later. I can't remember if it's her or the other cop that, you know, there was no record of a station wagon or these people that you're talking about. So that's a mega psyop to, again to sort of like get Nick thinking maybe he's crazy, you know, throw him off base and get him sort of acting on emotion rather than thinking rational as a detective. Yeah. Just a reminder Jay's explanation of this movie makes the movie about 90% better than when you actually it's watch it. It's literally coming from a place of trying to make this into a <laughs> Like, the, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how much the Nick, big Nicolas Cage lobby I got a call last you. night and he was like, listen, Jay, if you could do me a big favor and just try to at least be creative about convincing Tristan and the audience to... Maybe just give him another look, right? You, you, you just take another chance on where you're at. Maybe see if it's something that's not as bad as they say. <coughs> right. That, that's what Nick said on the phone last night. So that's I, 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 we kind of deduced that from your your blatant shilling for for this movie, which I think <laughs> you make me like the movie now. When I'm watching it, I'm just laughing at how bad it is, and that you you try to you've gaslit me into well, thinking I mean, this is actually Nick a Cage, decent movie. Like again, when he. First of all, when Lily Sobieski goes, ah, and she jumps on his back, that right, her squeak is front funny. Him then body slamming her over a table. And he does the WWE her, moves on some bitches, and that was pretty funny. Kicking her into the wall, and she flies into a wall of pictures. Yeah. I mean, I was literally crying laughing at that last night. Yeah, and he does he does punch that other woman. And he um, knocks out the <laughs> I love his line when he first comes in there and he's like so what are you supposed to be like some kind of bar maid or something? And she's like, I'm the innkeep. <laughs> it's like, are you like a bar maiden or something? Like, so he gives her this derogatory bar maiden term, which she immediately takes offense to. And we know that they're going to have this like fight. I mean, it's it, him running around in a bear suit and knocking out witches. That that's And awesome. calling them and oh. calling them bitches. Like, you bitches. Bitches. You bitches. Yeah. And <clears throat> remember too, Lily Sobieski is interesting because it wasn't <laughs> too long. A few, it was only five or six years or seven or eight years prior to this that she played the uh, SEX trafficked eyes wide shut victim in the costume owner's store in eyes wide shut and she, oh you're right well she's way better than that though she's but well the point i'm just making is that sometimes you you're know, right man i forgot i knew i, I, I knew I, she looked familiar but yeah i don't know she's in quite a few movies yeah she was and i was reading some interviews with her and actually this is surprising too she hasn't been in movies since 2009 and so a lot of people were wondering what happened to lily sobieski she was in so many 90s 2000s movies and then she quit she actually said which is honorable she said that i decided that i would no longer be in movies because now that i have kids so many movies request you to be in these bizarre you know sex yeah. scenes she's like i decided to retire from acting and so yeah, you know good. props to her for making a wholesome decision um so, but anyway, it's just interesting to see that, you know, she's not just playing this mind controlled uh, sex operative here. She's also a mind controlled sex operative in, uh, in Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah. And she's, she's a, she's an empowered woman in this one. She's a, she's an independent woman. Well, all of her interactions with Nick Cage are pretty funny because he's like, you don't have any honey. He's like, he's like, well, why don't you have a store bought? And she goes, we have no royal jelly for you. Yeah. And that means, well, the royal jelly is only, only for the queen, right? In other words, you don't get real honey. You're a man and you're a drone. So she's telling him he's the drone, yeah. right? Uh, and, and because, if, you know, royal jelly is only for the queen. Because yeah. it's, it's the most nutrient, right? 
Yeah, yeah, the royal jelly is only fed to the queen. Um, I feel like you're getting mad. Like I'm doing too much apologetics for this movie, and, and no, you know, no, it's just like I, it's, it's not that. It's just your face in general. Like there's some like the way that you are. That's that grates on us. I think it's not like the things you say necessarily, or or why or how you say them. It's like what you are in your essence. That's what bothers us. That's and by that, us, I mean everybody watching. To be honest, that, that hurtful toxicity coming out once again. <laughs> I mean. <coughs> Here's the thing, I can't laugh too much because I was there coughing. <coughs> Excuse me. That's all those pots you were doing earlier. Now, I won't be surprised, uh, Tristan, if you know one day you wake up and your dog has gone to here live Here comes with an insult. Your dog it, may just go live with the neighbor because of all the toxicity. Bro, um, you're trying to make me cry. Anyway, so did you notice that she's eating the apple too? So the first scene we see with Lily. Sobieski, she's kind of a little bit flirty with Nick Cage, and she's eating an apple. She's well, yeah, kinda... they, they they play up the sexual tension thing between them. You're thinking, oh, is she going to seduce him? It's kind of, mm-hmm. they, they make it seem like that. But, uh, and she's having, she's eating an apple to, you know, like, um, symbolically, again, kind of give details. Uh, he represents the law, but they read this as, oh, you represent the patriarchal man's law. Your man's law don't rule here. When he goes to the schoolhouse, that, uh, that's an interesting scene because we see a William Blake uh, um, citation up on the chalkboard, which of course Blake yeah. was a weird esoteric. No, I, I uh, didn't. I didn't pause it to actually read the quote, but it seems it's something from his poem. Either because she's in, standing in front of it, it's hard to tell. You can't really see it, and then he he erases it and writes his yeah. name over it. And then when she closes the door, it's very interesting. We see the egg and the snake around it, which is the Orphic mysteries. It's from Plato. It's from the Timaeus. And so I think, you know, that's a key indicator that if Nick Cage had been paying attention to the to the symbolism, if he had read Esoteric Hollywood, he would have known ah, I'm in, you know, total pagan land that they view nature as a cyclical uh, thing. Uh, we have the same sequence where when he goes to the uh, former church, it's in ruins and he gets locked in this uh, underwater, you know, catabasta scenario where he kind of has a, a death burial resurrection again symbolizing that he's going to be the, the one to to die in the near future um do you know what i'm talking about with plato's the orphic egg have you seen yeah. that have you noticed yeah. it okay mm-hmm. um oh they're also the seduceus see. on the on the image of the uh there's a seduceus on the doctor's office on the front of the doctor's office you mean a caduceus i like a seduceus C- better caduceus the seduceus i'm gonna say seduceus from now on be like <laughs> you want to get my course you want to get my course on how to get erotic and get some love? Uh, it's called Master Seducius. And yeah. it'll be a logo of a Caduceus. Yeah, you, um, you could be Frank T.J. Mac Dre. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, did you see that new P.T. Anderson movie, by the way? The What was the last one? Was Licorice Pizza in that P.T. Anderson? Did you see that? I didn't watch it, no. And I haven't seen The Master. Oh, not The Master. I haven't seen um, the, the last one with, with Lewis, uh, uh, Phantom Thread. I haven't seen those two. I haven't seen that either. I didn't have I any interest about- in watching Phantom Thread for some reason. It just seemed like I was just like, oh, this looks gay. Uh, the one about the baseball guys, that one was kind of lame. Phantom, yeah, I don't know. Phantom Thread, he's like a, he's a fashion designer or something. But it's Daniel Day Lewis, so it's hard to not watch a Daniel Day Lewis movie. And I'm just like, is this like some gay stuff? I don't know. Yeah, probably. Spe- um, speaking of gay stuff, though, hey, uh, shout out to any. How many of you guys live in California? How many of you guys live in near Los Angeles, California? Our friend Jay Dyer is going to be there really soon with his wife Jamie at and a Pride party, Pride event. They're, yes. they're doing a uh, they're doing a women's march. They're doing a women's march in Los women's Angeles. Pride gonna, march in honor yeah. of. Um, they're trying to bring yeah. back the pussy hats basically it's like, i'm not trying to I'm not trying to get a spoiler alert but the, the whole, remember the whole pussy hat thing from 2016 they're, they're trying to bring it back so march 15th over there jay you want to give a shout out to your event you got a uh, you got not only jay and jamie but you have another yeah. jamie <laughs> yeah jay kennedy bro. <laughs> jay kennedy jamie kennedy scream jamie kennedy experiment many other ghost whisper i mean he's in a lot of a lot of stuff uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun eight months ago uh, with Jamie. Um, I did a opening set of about 20 minutes of impressions. Then we had Jamie Hanshaw give a lecture on uh, occult symbolism in film in Hollywood. That went on for an hour and a half. Great time. Then I gave a lecture on uh, philosophy for the Metanarratives book, hour and a half or so. And then we had Jamie come and do, we did some Q&A and then he did a 20-minute a stand-up set. Everybody loved it. It was a lot of fun. 
Um, so we're being another one of those new materials. So no, it's not the same old stuff. Uh, it's going to be new material. Five hours, uh, March 15th. If you guys want to go to my uh, community notes, my Twitter, my website, you can see the Eventbrite link. I just dropped a link in the chat too. There's a link there in the chat, guys. You can click on that one and get your tickets. It's a lot of fun. Uh, people always say, can we drink beer? I, so you can bring your own alcohol and all that. Most places in California allow you to do that. So I don't have tap and all that. On, it's like on bring, your own, bring your own bong or like what? What's up with that? Uh, we won't be able to do pots. Okay. We won't do the pots. What about like so, harder stuff? Harder stuff like uh, um, like Bring Jankum. your own DMT. Jankum? Jankum. Right. Yeah, DM, yeah. Ayahuasca? You're going to do like ayahuasca ceremony afterwards? Pretty much or a no? strictly only crack event. Um, yeah, okay. I like to have, you know, people attentive and awake. So no, s- no sniffing, but smoking school. Uh, all uppers, no downers type events. I think. Ah, uh, all right. All right. Poppers. Basically, only poppers. huffing gasoline is what we allow in my events. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, you, so, uh, what about um, whippets? Do you have any whippets there? Is that going to be provided or bring your own whippets? Uh, whippets uh, and um, t- uh, tobacco are also allowed. Uh Okay, so it's bring your own crack. Uh, bring your own- <laughs> there are no more. That's pretty much all of them. Okay. So. All right. Um, paint, huff, paint, paint huffing? Uh, no, only gasoline. Okay. Anyway, so let's see the eggs. Only the girls are edgy. That's all in the first one. Uh, that's all in the first one. Interesting they make a comparison to when he asks about, well, what's your punishment on this island? And she's like, oh, well, we believe in capital punishment. It's like, yeah. Well, human like patriarchal of equating human sacrifice with capital capital punishment, which that's not exactly what it is. But um, she she has interesting ways to kind of get around all of his questioning. Uh, let's see, burnt offerings. Uh, they abort the males. I thought that was interesting to to see the you know strict feminist perspective. It's very intent on True. population control and aborting men. Uh, I thought, and he just leaves. So. Yeah, cool, well, men, men are only your own used stream or whatever. I just, uh, you know, you know, my audience. I don't typically leave, but you know, it's different over here. So, wait, what? What did you say? I mean, you just walked off. What you, <laughs> I mean, dude? You're talking like, look. Here's the thing. You start talking, we get bored. I- I'm trying not to fall asleep here. Tristan goes in the other room. <laughs> just just like I'm just gonna go, gonna go, gonna go do some freaking poppers and whippets in the other Ooh, room. I'll be back. He goes and uh, hurts his dog's feeling. Comes back. So, you know, huff some, huff a little paint. Do some poppers. Throw some slam some um, whippets. I mean, did you so- that she uh, when she mentions the bloodlines and all that, uh, then Willow explains to Nick Cage, it's only a story. Like we don't really believe all of these things. It's just stories, which is interesting because real witchcraft, which does exist, also says the same thing. It's just myths. We don't take these god stories seriously. But then mm. now you have on TikTok people actually doing abortions as offerings. Have you seen right. this? Yes. Well, yeah, they had having uh, abortion parties. I remember having these, uh, I did some streams a few years ago about people, you know, celebrating their abortions. And there was this oh, one wow. woman who talked yeah. about, there was a, a viral video a couple of years ago. And this woman <coughs> said that, um, well, this is, this is how you can do a, you know, a post abortion healing ritual. You remember that one? Yes, I do now. No. Oh, kind of viral. Yeah, so I mean, this is the the in the real world. That's this is what they do, right? They they will say, "Oh no, the, you know, nobody." I remember like ten years ago, even fifteen years ago, like when stuff was starting to come out about satanic abuse, satanic cults, uh, you know, this kind of stuff, and people would say, "Nobody's serious about that. It's all just stories." Uh, oh, but, just, they're just playing dress up. They're just doing a yeah. LARP. They don't lucky. care. Real. Well, that's the thing. Is like the, this is a fine line between irony and and mm-hmm. and you know just kind of ironically doing something and then actually doing it. You and I have talked about this a few times yeah. on streams recently, where it's like look at the like at the uh, just like the jackass phenomenon, right? Where it's like, oh, I'm yeah. Steve O, and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna get this is called doing sodomy and eating a goldfish. <laughs> It's like they're, they're, <laughs> this is what hipsters would do, right? Hipsters would be like, 
uh, dude, like, what if I, like, satanic, what if I went to a satanic ritual dressed up in garb or whatever, and it was, like, a real satanic ritual, but I was there ironically. Like, yeah, and then we were just, like, we, like, ironically actually sacrifice a baby. Yeah. Wouldn't that be amazing? And, like, the Christians would be so triggered. They'd be like, oh, you're, like, doing Satanism, but it's like, no, we're, this is, like, meta-irony. Like, oh. Uh. Yeah, and that's the thing is that some people do take this serious and do really believe in it and do act on it, and uh, that was an interesting thing. Did you notice... When, when everybody's out there in the costumes, there's a little kids in bee costumes. <laughs> mm. So they dress the kids up as little bees. Just to torture him, you know, to, that, to torture his psyche and trigger him. And well, I just, it looked just like the Blind Melon video, right? Do you remember the Blind Melon? I don't. I don't. I don't think I ever saw the. I know the song, the one song. All that they, I can say is that my life is pretty plain. I mean, that's kind of weird. That like, what I liked is at the at the end, when when they put him in the Wicker Man. Right, and then uh, this is after they do the bee thing. They put the bees on his head. Like, oh no, the bees! And they put him Not in there. The bees! Not the bees! They put him in there, and he, uh, and he, he looks at the camera, and he's like, "Well, I guess this is a real wicker man." And he winks, and then it plays the blind melon song. <laughs> Yeah, and and the, yeah, that was that was like that was peak so look, here's Nicolas the best Cage joke, cinema. The best joke though, when at the end of the movie, Nicolas caged. That's true. Meta. That's totally that meta. Oh, so, that was like perfect dad joke. Right? Nicholas in the cage. Yes. In the cage. Um, you know that that Genesis song, "In the Cage." That's a kind of a. You don't know that. <laughs> it's from like I can feel Peter Gabriel it's Genesis. You a big Genesis fan? Uh, Peter Gabriel era the, Genesis. The early Genesis, the okay, the yeah, abstract yeah, yeah. acid tripping Genesis. Yeah, yeah, like the when, when Genesis the, was like crazy pro army Genesis. <laughs> yeah, not well. I mean, there's this Phil Collins Genesis was pretty good too. There's some good ones. But, there's some good ones. I do like some. Of but them. the Genesis, they had that album, "The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway," and there's a song in the cage on there, and it's got this like this cool synth riff. In the cage. So, for those that have not seen the variant versions, by the way, for those that are aficionados of the Nick Cage Wicker Man, there are variations on the. <laughs> for you uh, fellow version. huge fans of the Nick Cage Wicker Man, uh, I run the the message boards. I feel like the, you're the you got to be the biggest one. Like there can't be that many more people who love this movie so much. I, I, yeah, there's everybody hates this movie universally. Um, but it's, this takes a lot of guts for you to stick up for it, and I've, I'm convinced. I like it now. I mean, you you like it now. So I did my apologetic work. So well, now because Nick, I watched it, on, you, I have to admit, Nick, I watched it on this, 1. 1. 5, I watched it on 1.5 speed, so I didn't I didn't fully get to absorb it. I was really bored with the pacing. I was just like, hurry up, threw it on 1.5 and just blazed through it. Well, I mean. To, you should always watch Crage in normal speed uh, because that's when Nick is at his best. When he's in, that's Rage, Nick Cage Rage. I call it Crage. Raging. He's craging. Raging. They need to make, yeah, that so. sounds like a 90s candy. That's like a sour candy. Crage. I got a pack of Crages. I think we should make a candy based on Nick Cage's Rage called Crage. <laughs> it'd, be like like, it'd be like a, a what are those really sour Warheads. It'd be like you would do a warheads, yeah, but they're warhead. shaped like Nicolas Cage's face. It makes you angry when you when you suck on this thing. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much all. I, I, I did like this. So the one variant ending has James Franco and uh, John Ritter's son. I think his name's Josh Ritter. Dude, that's the uh, best. That ending is hilarious. Yeah. When uh, and they're at a bar, and uh, Willow and Lily Sobieski are there, uh, basically honey potting the next two dupes. Uh, but that life. that kind of gave it a little bit of a kind of a feminist twist because these guys, you know, James Franco, especially being in real life a notorious creeper weirdo. Um, well, this is, but I think there's, a, I can't remember if that's in the theatrical because I saw this in the theater when it came out, and then uh, on the DVD that I have, I have both alternate endings, and then we watched it on Amazon, and Amazon gave us the no bees in James Franco ending. Yeah, I think and that's then, the theatrical yeah. no bees with yeah, Franco yeah. because mine doesn't say special edition or anything like that. Okay, and yeah, so do you, uh, my favorite part of the Franco ending is how they're they're kind of like toxic masculinity. They're in the bar, they're looking for chicks. There's no prospects, 
And uh, it's a really corny scene. They're looking around and trying to find some chicks. And Frank goes like, hey, there's one over there. Right and then they're they and she's up. immediately like, "Can I come to your house tonight?" <laughs> yeah, well, they go over, they sit down. The girls are giving him the googly eyes, and uh, two of them, they, they, the one girl whispers to the other one, and then um, <laughs> she's like, "Can we go to the bar and get some drinks?" <laughs> they're, they're at a bar, but they had sat down at the table. Can we let's go to the bar and get some drinks? Two <laughs> right. of them walk off, and then the the one chick's like, "Where are you going after this?" He's like, uh, "It's my apartment." Can I come? Can I come with you? And, then it, <laughs> and that's like the last shot. And I think he smiles. And then I think it cuts to her dead eyed stare looking all seductive or whatever. And then it's a uh, roll credits. <laughs> it's, it's funny cool. to me that they cut the B scene though. I mean, they, because the B scene is like, it's a meme. Everybody talk. I mean, it's like, a, it's an infinite eternal meme. Right? Do you think it's because it was, it maybe would have got him like an R rating because they, they, the bees and then they break Could his be. knees. They, they smash his so, legs. It's also so ridiculous. Right. Like, but the, the bees wasn't as graphic, but then when they smash his legs, I think maybe that would have been a little bit much. I don't know. True. They could have given that R rating. Cause it had, I mean, I think they Good. knew it was going to be a flop at the box office. Actually, uh, it broke even. So look at this. You I just, think. you know, you have so many, so many lovely facts. Once again, <laughs> once again, I'm gotta, re- you proved me wrong at every critique yeah, I, I have. I'm doing Nicholas uh, uh, pre-sup occasional apologetics, right? <laughs> That's right uh, I mean, I got to pre-sup your assumption that you just assumed it was I, a flop. Actually, it broke even. So. And I fell right into your trap. I didn't I didn't realize that I came into this with massive presuppositions about this movie being shitty. But even when I, I even, even my, <laughs> you fact checked me every single step of the way and you win. Like this is, actually. I know. This, yeah, um, actually, it broke even. Um, Tristan, it actually well, broke even. Technically, looking this up, I was going for memory. <laughs> technically, it almost broke even. So it's basically a million dollars from breaking even. So I mean, and, and you've probably spent that much money, you know, promoting this movie. You've you've put at least a million dollars worth of apologetics into this. this. Is so probably my third video on the Nicolas Cage Wicker Man. So yes, Jay, Jay, <laughs> Jay, Jay actually donated one million dollars. <laughs> To Wicker Man to make sure that it broke even so that they could maybe make a sequel somehow. He's just, he wants it so bad. He actually donated a million of his own Bitcoin dollars. I have donated an inordinate amount of time to defending this <laughs> and convincing the world that it is actually fun. Um, no, dude, the, yeah, the, you, you the, convinced you me, should, if you, if you If you want something even more ridiculous, uh, definitely Con Air. I mean, have you seen Face Off? Yeah, Face Off I've seen, but I think I was probably, when did that come out? Was it like 97? 96, 7, something like that. I, I must have been like 11 or so when I saw Face Off, uh, so I think I, mean, I didn't. pretty preposterous. Uh, it was over the top. I mean, The Rock, preposterous over the, the top. The Rock was amazing. The Rock was, that was like my favorite movie. Oh, you like that, really? Dude, I loved The Rock. I thought it was so funny. It was, I mean, it was, it was like an entertaining, ridiculous, stupid action movie. I used to really like that one. With uh, that, when he's in the hot, is that Sean one? Connery, Nick Cage, and Dustin Hoffman, John, right? John Cusack, maybe. Yeah, is that Dustin people. Hoffman? And he's like, there's that line when he's, sir, with all due respect, sir, fuck you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that one line. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of i mean the 90s was all about like one-liners you know well, he has the the glass poison ball and he shoves the, it in the, the dude's the mouth balls. and then punches yeah, it the and breaks balls. it and yeah the green balls man that's all i really remember and sean connery toxic well, masculinity from sean, sean connery, connery is actually in that movie i kid you not he's loosely supposed to be bond because mm. in the i'm serious in the story um other people have noticed this too if you if you watch in the story he is a former british intelligence operative who's been arrested for you know going off script or whatever there's other references that make that they make to james bond so they're implying that it's kind of supposed to be you know james bond when he's old so nice yeah no, i i didn't catch on to that actually when i saw the rock i don't think i'd really i think that was before <laughs> Maybe Golden Eye had come out, but I don't think there were yeah, a lot yeah. of, yeah. And I hadn't seen any of the old Bond movies at that time. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. I mean, I was '90s high school dude too, so I didn't know what was going on. But if you listen to the dialogue, what 
uh, when Sean Connery starts explaining his previous work, he's like, you know, uh, you know, the whole JFK event. I know a thing or two about that. So we're supposed to think that he was involved in the JFK assassination uh, and all these yeah. other previous black ops. So some deep lore in there. So you like the rock too. I mean, come on, dude, Nicholas Cage is in it. You know, you like it. You well, can't. it's, it's, it's not at, but it's, it's a decent action movie face off, decent action movie with like medium levels of absurdity. Mm. But the thing with Con Air is that it's so ridiculous. Just I cranked mean, up to 11. All right, yeah, I gotta, I gotta watch yeah. Con Air. Dude, it's, I really think it only makes it's so ridiculous that it has to be. I think it had to be a, a, a comedy. It's just, it doesn't. You'll see what I mean if you watch it. The Rock kind of was somewhat a comedy movie. Maybe inadvertently. So the, the levels of, of absurdity in The Rock uh, are just like, it's taken to like the, the, to the next, to the third degree, the third <clears throat> power with, with Con Air. I mean, it's just wild. By the way, John Malkovich is actually a pretty good villain. Yes. Yeah. In yeah. that. Well, yeah. Cyrus the Virus. What was that movie called? Waking John Malkovich, right? Um, being John Malkovich, but being John Malkovich, and wait, isn't Nicholas Cage is not in that? No, he's in adaptation, but uh, adaptation where he plays John Malkovich. Malkovich. But uh, adaptation is uh, John Cusack. I mean, uh, uh, being John Malkovich is John Cusack. Adaptation, Nick Cage. Yeah, adaptation. I really liked adaptation. It, it is a good movie. Pretty yeah. long. We, we rewatched right. that for. We did a Jamie and I did a Nick Cage night. We did adaptation. You did a Nick Cage decade. We know. What can I say? <laughs> I um, mean, Nick Cage wants to be Elvis. I want to be Nick Cage. How's that? More like Nick Cage wants to be Jay Dyer. And he's using his Wicker Man witchcraft <laughs> to reach into your mind and slowly become. Does he, does he really wink in that scene that you're talking about? No, he doesn't wink and look at the I camera and say, I guess this is a Wicker Man. Does no. he say that? No, <laughs> would, you would almost expect. Him I would to. believe that. It's, I mean, that's so preposterous. Like fourth wall break, and say, <laughs> and say the name. It's like a meme. Like you wait, why break the fourth wall. I mean, that, that movie is so uh, just ridiculous. So, like, why not do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, that would be great. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past them. Do that. Well, what movie are we doing next? What are we gonna do on our next one? We already watched. I feel like we already watched a few. Well, I mean, I'd like to do the Dunes with you. Yeah, yeah, I gotta, I gotta see the Dune Part Two. That's gonna be, I won't be able to see it for a couple of weeks. Did you ever watch the the David Lynch Dune back in the day? I watched half of it and then fell asleep when I tried. It was I couldn't follow because I never read the books. So I did you enjoy the part one of the new Dune? Yeah, it was pretty good. It was, I mean, it wasn't. You could tell it's leading up to something better. Mm-hmm. You could tell it's not. It's definitely not a standalone film. But I thought, I thought the first, the first Dune was really solid. I mean, it's it's like Star Wars, but not gay. Exactly. It's like, uh, yeah. Um, and by the way, if yeah, if you get a chance to see, you know, part two, we could do that. If you can't get to the theater and see it, no, I, I, it's it's playing in two weeks. I can see it in English. Well, I'm just saying we could probably pick something before two weeks from now. Um, no, I don't want to talk to you. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Didn't we already watch something else? What else? I was doing. We should do. Uh, well, I just I just watched Magnolia again. I love that movie. You seen Magnolia at all? Because yeah, after we po- after actually we did a podcast on Magnolia. It was one of the first podcasts I put up. I love that. That's one of my favorites. Um, I mean, Frank T. Well, J. Well, so how about uh, you, you want to do something goofy or you want to do something deep with philosophical depth that we could, you know, dissect? Either one. Either one's fun. What's the audience want? What's the audience? What's the demand? audience? Yeah, it's, it's suggestions here. And uh, someone well, says Chris steel magnolias, space balls. Shut up. <laughs> um, yeah. What, what do you guys think? Vanilla Sky. Someone's. Oh, that's an interesting one. I remember Vanilla Sky. It is. We did Mind it not control. too long ago. Um, yeah, I gotta do a new one. So maybe something that we haven't done. You know, I mean, it was a while back when we did Wicker Man. So well, that's for the, those of you who've made it to the end, we got we got a bunch of the audience still sticking around here. Make sure to comment down below. What what like future analyses would you like us to do in our struggle sessions here? I mean, obviously, after Jay apologizes to me for being so mean today, um, we'll we'll probably be able to make up and we can do another struggle session. Throw it in there. People who want Con Air, but is that is that is there enough there to do? You probably have to pair it with another 
yeah. you know, something with Nicholas Cage, something with Nicholas. No, I don't like any, just something with uh, some depth, you know. I don't, I don't think, I don't think Con Air could stand on its own as a, yeah. We'll figure it out. It was another reminder for those of you who didn't hear it earlier. Jay's got an event in LA for what is it like uh less than two weeks from now. It's the fifteenth. Uh Jay Dyer, Jamie, Jamie Kennedy. They're gonna be doing um it's it's like vaudeville. It's actually gonna it's gonna be the whole it's a five hour vaudeville style live event. I was I be there as Nick Cage the entire time. Yes. Yes. And I actually wrote it. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be a vaudeville but it's going to be silent so it's going to be a silent uh performance a five-hour play that we put on five-hour play and it's going to be in it's going to be black and white and it's going to be on a projector and jay's going to be walking through the audience explaining to you guys and and, and doing apologetics like he did for wicker man <laughs> yeah. here he'll be this actually that sounds live. like it might be kind of a fun performance art sketch to do i might actually steal this from you <laughs> okay okay yeah actually, patent pending <laughs> so patent pending what, well, Jay, what i know what we're gonna do we're gonna put on a live one man act of wicker man <laughs> <laughs> it'll be it'll be me playing every character in the nick cage wicker man in a live yeah. performance that's gonna be that's, that's gonna be five hours. Yes, it's gonna be the extended cut. Um, but I'll it, be reading every piece of the script out. <laughs> like I'll be reading. It out well, it takes a while because he has to run backstage and change. And put on a wig to be the witches. Yeah, yeah so he's like he just constant costume changes for every character he plays. So like you'll have, you'll stop in the middle of a line. I'll run back, <laughs> put the bear suit on, come back out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put a wig on, punch myself. <laughs> um, so you guys make sure I, I drop the link in there the uh, uh, the event bright link make sure to make it over there to uh, Jay Jamie and Jamie Kennedy over also there we'll have books there book signing all of that will be there for sure hit them up guys I, I know I don't know how, how many people are watching are in California put your put your address uh, your full name your address your social security number and uh, I, I just we're taking a also poll here. We're then, like you know, Vegas is only three four hour peak drive. You can drive over if you're in the Vegas area. If you guys That's right. Like, it's a Friday night. It's not in the middle of the week like last time. That was the only day we could get the venue last time. So this time we lucked out on getting a Friday night venue. So nice, nice. That'll be awesome. I wish I wish I could go. Um, You'd love our events are so much fun. In fact, I mean, I wish you were here. If you, uh, I'd have you speak at the event and you know get up there and do your. Uh, one man act performance portrayals of rent vagina monologues. I know you, <laughs> yeah. I know you're really well studied in vagina monologues. You can do those all on your own. <laughs> I, I do the, uh, the, <laughs> well, mine's the penis monologues, obviously. Do you remember when like... that was all popular? Ooh, the vagina monologues. Yeah, that was like the joke. I mean, that was around the same time as, uh, your other favorite joke, um, uh, broke back mountain. Um, mm -hmm. these are like, when I, I think I was, I think I was like 15 yeah. or 16 when those came out. Maybe 2001, and and they had all. They just had this slew of like everything Garbage. started becoming gay. Yeah. They're like, let's make everything a little gay. Now everything and, is and just, AIDS, so, right? Yes, AIDS and gay, right? Because rent is about AIDS and gay. Was so. it cats about something like that? Cats like about no. Gay? Cats is just weird, dude. You never seen cats? No, dude. I don't watch any of those. No time for this nonsense. Yeah, but it's like the most famous musical, so most people have seen. Is it, it. Is it not about like lesbian ladies or something? It's about actual cats, like furries. So it's furry stuff. It's, so it's, it's always kind of perfect. I, actually, we did a boiler room where I argued, "What if cats was preparing people to be furries?" I could you not? That was on a boiler room like ten years. That ago. makes sense. That's what it seemed like. I mean, it was like the early furries. <sighs> Humans in cat suits doing a musical, and it's as ridiculous as you. Well, that's I mean, what I, I would do. I mean, if we were at your thing, I'm more into dogs. I'm allergic to cats, so I would do dogs. Yeah. I would do dogs. Okay. Rent, rent dogs would be basically my... yeah. So gay dogs. <laughs> rent dogs, yeah. With AIDS, with dog AIDS. It, gay it, dogs it, with dog AIDS. Uh, basically, it, it's the same plot as cats, but it's yeah. just gay dogs with. Dogs. No, and, and, the, and it would like it would be called rent. It would be rent gay dogs. And then the subtitle, like the you know the whatever the the next part of the title would be. <laughs> the subtitle is "Gay Dogs with." No, it'd be, it'd be it'd be humping is a form of communication. Would be the next. Okay. Right. 
like so it's it's, it's an anti bigotry it's it, you know we're trying to Positive, normalize yes. <laughs> because like people get mad at the dog park if your dog starts you know humping they don't understand that this is a form of of communication anti rape anti bullying anti bigotry right the dog parks have become so the Karens have ruined the dog parks you can't even the dogs can't even hump in in the dog parks anymore cuz these freaking Karens all out there with their Christopher Lee Bro, I hate dog her. parks are the stupidest thing in the world. I would never go to a freaking dog park. Um, <laughs> all right. So yeah, you guys, I would, I would, I would be at the event, but I would have to remove my restraining order against Jay. It, it's like, a, there's a lot of legal steps that I would have to take to be able to, um, there's also <laughs> legalities for presenting, um, you know, vagina monologues as my event, which yeah. person would want to do. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I have to like, yeah, there's cer- I'd have to make, there's certain uh, announcements I'd have to make to the crowd. Contractual uh, agreements, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, no, I'm talking about like legal, legally binding yeah, contractual, thing. Contractual agreements are legal, Tristan. Contract- okay, that's true. So, so if <laughs> the Eventbrite link is in the chat there. You guys make sure to hit Jay up over there in California on the 15th. Uh, I get 90% of the benefits from any tickets that he sells just in general. Veterans uh, benefits from the meme wars. Yeah, because I'm a veteran of the 2016 meme wars. Um, and make sure to support yourself and support your own health by hitting up chalk.com, the most based supplement company out there. Where's my little chalk banner? I got one of those somewhere. Where's my chalk banner? Use that coupon code Big Fifty Three Life, Big Five Three Life to get fifty three percent off all subscriptions for life at chalk.com. Make sure to like the video, share the video. If you're not already subscribed. Make sure to subscribe. If you think you're subscribed, you might actually not be subscribed because YouTube's algorithm is weird sometimes. Sometimes you got to resubscribe <coughs> like, like three or four times. Excuse me for all the coughing today. Got a little little cough going around here. Too many pots earlier that you did? Yeah, too many poppers. Too many busting, busting lots of poppers lately. Lots of, um, lots of whippets. The whippets are really getting to me. Um, you know, we like, we like to potty. Um, I'm joking, obviously. There's going to be some tards who... It's like the stupidest drug ever. It's like... Yeah, that's only teenagers, are, you know, want to do... Oh, whippets. so you're going to make fun of psychedelics, but you promote using whippets? Dude, <laughs> what a freaking idiot. Freaking... Okay, what you super dizzy for like 30 seconds. It's gonna be so Bro, awesome. so you make fun of ayahuasca, but like you'll do synthetics do like poppers. What a freaking... You're so lame, dude. I'm about to go to uh, WA, Whippets Anonymous, so they get addicted to the <laughs> Poppers Anonymous? <laughs> <laughs> A Jankum support group. Well, I, just, I don't know how to describe it. Like when my wife, my wife left me, and then like the first time I got super dizzy, I was like, "This is where I want to live. I want to live and being super dizzy all the time." But I just never stopped doing whippets for like the last year. Just to see like Jay, it's like, and that's and that's when I knew I was addicted to Nicolas Cage. It was that moment after I spent three hours defending Wicker Man and actually convinced my friend to like it against all logic and reality. That's when I realized that this is I had a problem, and I I I was too obsessed with Nicolas Cage. Uh, I actually think it would be really funny to do a one man act presentation of Nicolas Cage's Wicker Man. That's a- <laughs> that would be the best. That sounds awesome, dude. Seriously, well, I like our other idea that we right brainstorm. I do. I know that Jay's event's going to be sick because we we were helping. We were kind of brainstorming his opening his opening monologue earlier with uh, the. Um, the the Bohemian Grove, walking through the the, the pizza game, <laughs> all that you got you got to use that one. Um, Actually, I did write that down. That's on this note, and then I wrote down uh, one man act Nicholas Cage Wicker Man. That's, so this mm-hmm. is this well, is those idea. those are patent penny. You're gonna have to pay, you're gonna have to pay me um hefty money for those <laughs> those, those dumbass jokes. But yeah, you guys will love it. I think it's, it'll be fun. Uh, I wish I could be there with all y'all. And uh, I'm sure some of you, we'll see Jay and I together before that. We'll probably try to do another stream, another movie soon. The Rapture. You'll see us in the Rapture floating up. Yeah, <laughs> you'll see us in the, in the, uh, but Nicolas Cage will be there. There's the knowing Rapture. So there'll be those little weird, <laughs> those so it's little actually weird aliens that are rapturing us exactly. Yeah, the blonde, the blonde aliens will be first rapturing Nicolas Cage. All right, man. Any, cool. any last thoughts, Jay? Yeah. No, I think it was really fun to revisit these with you and uh, get your take on it, and especially since you hadn't seen the original one. So, um, yeah. yeah, really good breakdown. I think our breakdowns are top notch. So, here we got everybody. Be sure and uh, like and share this, comment and all that. Yeah, so. Drop them st- super chats too. You know, you can always drop super chats after the fact. At any time. Um, 
Logan Daly says face off for two dollars. Thank you, Logan Daly. Bill Hicks donated five Australian dollars through Super Chat. So are they, are five A's. I don't know if that's Australian. I think Australia is A U S. He says just a small donation towards the Wigger Man movie crowdfund, not the weave, not the weave. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be that's genius. That's gonna be the last line. Uh, Logan Daly donated five bucks through Streamlabs. Says nub up, Chad nerds. Good to see my favorite ED of us collabing again. Right on, guys. All right, yeah, Wigger Man's coming. I mean, it's gonna be, it's gonna be hard. I think it might be hard to convince Cat to give us his weave, but. I mean, you could maybe Jamie Kennedy can can get you talk to Cat connected to Cat Williams on that one. All right, bigots, we're out of here. We'll see you guys next time. Good night and good luck and enjoy enjoy uh, enjoy your weekend, guys. Or your week. Enjoy it's your, Wednesday. Uh, Crimbus and your what's the uh, Kwanzaa? Happy Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa, happy Kwanzaa. Happy, it's, early, it's a little bit early for Kwanzaa. Happy early Kwanzaa. Um, <laughs> happy Wotan Day or whatever. Um, we out of here.